All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is May 6th, 2023, and we've got a new king. Well, we've got a new king. I'm Canadian, so I guess we've got a new king, but not really our king, is he? We are waiting for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we know the time is near at hand. We've been working at it, breaking it down, revealing the revelation of him for the past five and a half years. It is the revelation of his is to come, and that is to come will begin at the moment of the pre-trib escape of the Bride of Christ, which will happen because there is a pre, there is a mid, and there is a post. It is part of the mystery of the revelation of the end of days. They are all true. And the first is at hand. We've been talking about it for a long time, and we know it's connected to the true feast of weeks. And so today isn't where we're going to go. That's not the subject we're going to get into. What I wanted to do today was get into the the revelation of the Gospels, right? What we call the mystery, the, the differences that are found in the Gospels. And as a matter of fact, not only the differences within the Gospels that have been a mystery since they were written for, for everybody through all the translations, you know, nobody's really fully understood why we have three synoptic Gospels and John stands on his own, <coughs> you know, couldn't have just one gospel have done it and just have the the other positions in it and the other the views that were missing from some to be in the other you see and you could have still had the witnesses talked about the whole way through and those who were there and accounts along the way but we were given three in the synoptic gospels weren't we and we've been revealing here now for over five and a half years what the purpose of those three gospels are the world has known forever that Matthew is written to the Jews. Mark, not so much. You know, they, they think it's like a Jewish Gentile thing. Well, we know Mark is written to, quote unquote, the house of Israel to which the Gentiles are grafted in, which is also just called the world. And then you've got Luke. Luke was a Gentile, right? And Luke is written to the the portion that is ready the the ones watching and praying and diligently seeking and what you come to find out is that matthew mark and luke of the synoptic gospels the first will be last and the last will be first becomes luke mark and matthew not matthew mark and luke and all of these revelations that have connected to it are absolutely mind-blowing and and we're not going to go into absolutely everything i'm not going to break down all the understanding of that you know, you, you're going to be able to see that in a moment. You know, when I talk about the intro series, you'll be able to get more insight on that there. But you're going to see within this, not only these differences within the Gospels explained, and of course, we're not going to go into everything. That would be like a 10-hour video. But you're also going to see things that people didn't even realize were there for differences. You're going to notice, uh, just as an example, you're going to notice when we get into the topics of the resurrection story, okay, the, the, the last chapter, the beginning of the last chapter of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And you're going to see that these differences in there have never been seen as differences. It was just things that were happening at that time. And what has happened is it's because when the world living in the is witnesses those things, reads those things, they're looking at it with the eyes of now, right? The, the eyes of the is. Because the way it works is there's the was, which is the Old Testament from creation until Christ. The is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib escape. From the moment of the pre-trib escape forward is called the is to come. And what has happened is everybody's been trying to teach the is to come through eyes in the is and unaware of who the Gospels were speaking to. And it's an absolute fact. It is 100% true that with understanding them, their, their insights, their, their prophetic mysteries within these Gospels is the revelation of the is to come. 
But when you read it with eyes of the is, like the church has always done, then you could read the story of the resurrection in, in the last chapter of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And when you read it, you just think, oh, it's just, okay, that's a perspective here, and that's a perspective here. And in many cases, that's the case. They were never looked at in those cases as being discrepancies because the conversation is a little bit different. It's just like, okay, that was happening at this time. That was happening at this time of his resurrection. That was happening at this time. You know, they were just, it was just a different voice at those points, given the, the topic. But then there are clearly others that have never, ever been understood either. I mean, these haven't been understood, but then there are others that people have known were differences. And that within these differences, they couldn't explain them either except to say perspective. Well, we know, for example, at the Transfiguration, there is absolute clear discrepancy when you go to Luke's compared to Mark and Matthew's. You see, but when you have the eyes of the is to come, my goodness, everything changes. Because what happens when you have is to come eyes, we often call it that, right? Eyes that, you know, uh, 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 um, end time eyes, we call it. So these end time eyes, eyes that could see in the is to come, it doesn't just open the Gospels. The Gospels are just the beginning. It goes throughout all the New Testament, all the Old Testament, and all the way back to the creation. It's that fantastic. And what's happened is I hadn't, you know, I don't even remember the last time I made a video that was just dedicated to the differences in the Gospels, or what we call who the Gospels are speaking to with the focus on the Synoptic Gospels. And, and do we talk about it all the time? Absolutely. We, every single video has details of the differences in the Gospels. But I don't remember the last time I did one. It's been that long. Like, I'm talking a few years since I've done one just dedicated to these differences within the Gospels. And I figured it was appropriate because... We just finished this video right here, this intro video, which is the intro to the gospel's prophetic mysteries. And this intro is a 22 minute video to lead people in to what they're about to witness in this 30 minute video about the revelation of the gospels, which is what today we're gonna do. So this is a 30 minute intro on this one right here, but we're going to do this a full-blown one. Are we going to cover absolutely everything? No, definitely not. But we are going to cover a ton. We're going to show where the connections are, where they're talking about, their timing. You see, and then that intro to the intro will then lead you to the revelation of when you begin to understand who the Gospels are speaking to, you're going to realize that, oh my goodness, if everything we've learned comes from a foundation of Matthew, then what's going on with Mark and why does Mark's discourse have some differences, major differences than Matthew's? The answer is the whole world has missed that there's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets and everybody's focused because they have come through the understanding of Matthew, what we call looking through Matthew's eyes, everything the world and the church has seen is founded from the gospel of Matthew. And so they only see seven years. And so what does that lead you to? That will lead you to this final video in this, in this main intro series. And this video is about two hours and 45 minutes long. <coughs> Excuse me. And it will break down for you how this was all missed. But the foundation of the answer is it's all because of Matthew. Because nobody had yet understood why we needed to go into Mark and into Luke to discern these differences and why they were spoken of so differently. It's, it's fantastic. That's what's been going on here in this ministry for five and a half years. It revealed the end of days. It revealed the timing, the, the big picture, the smaller picture, the years of seals, the years of trumpets, pre, mid, post. The seven churches revealed. The stories in creation revealed. It sounds like, uh, it sounds like I'm, uh, I'm, you know, like it's, it's over the top, doesn't it? Especially if you're new to this ministry and you're hearing these words. It sounds like it's too far-fetched. There's no way. Well, I promise you, with all of my heart, with every fiber of my being, it is absolutely 100% true. 
And there are hundreds of videos throughout this ministry that will show you and will break it all down for you. Some of them, they are extremely detailed because we go into the details of the beginning, then the next seven years, then the next seven years, and how it relates from the beginning of creation to the end of Revelation. It is truly that powerful. But these videos right here, this will begin to give you the understanding. And then you can go into the 30 minute of this one, 30 minute of this one, and then understand how it was all missed, explained in this one, and it is going to blow your mind. And then I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have our brother Jimmy who does our beautiful website for us. I think there's gonna be another section under here, like now that you've graduated, right? Or now that you've begun to understand if you wanted to take it a step further, move into these videos. And this is where this video here that I'm doing today is going to go. But not only this video that I'm doing today, you know, another place if you're on YouTube, which is probably where the vast majority of you are watching this, this is the playlist you can come to, the Revealed End Time Study Note series. This is the and when you come here, here's that intro video again, you see? So here's that 22 minute intro. There's the one of who the Gospels are speaking to, that's an intro. There's your tribulation years, okay? Your, your 14 years part of the intro. So these are the three right now on the introduction page um, called the intro that's on the website. Well, from there, I'm also gonna include the video you're listening to now. I'm also gonna include the discourses revealed, which as we get going into this, I don't wanna to spend too much time on the differences within the discourses because we've got a video for that right here. And it's over two and a, it's a little over two and a half hours long. So that's how many differences are within the discourses that reveal their timing and their portions in the time of the is to come. So you're gonna see videos like that. You're gonna see pre, mid and post in there. Um, we'll probably even put the seven churches. It's, it's, it's that important. It's that big of a deal if you have ever desired to, to understand why we have these, what appear to be inconsistent differences within the gospels. And so as we get going, you're gonna see the, the simple straightforward ones. Of course, I'm gonna start with the simple and straightforward ones that we've even talked about in the intro video, uh, in the intro to the intro series, um, just to, to get people warmed up and to remind them of it. And then we're gonna go into some that go into a lot more detail. And as I said, what you're gonna see is some go into, into a detail that people never even really realized. But then there are those that people did realize were differences. And those are the ones that when you understand it, it, it the Bible opens up even more. And it's the, the supplementary differences, the ones that people didn't even realize were differences, that's when you know you're really getting into some meat and potatoes. I mean, these, th those differences that weren't realized they were differences, but the stories have different conversations of that period of time, those are the differences that that detail you could not get. There, there is no way to understand it if you're looking through the eyes of is and not the eyes of the end times, the eyes of the is to come because it would make absolutely no sense. And you're gonna see what I mean as we get into it. So don't forget, you can find all this as well at ministryrevealed.com. You can support the ministry here. We have GoFundMe, we have PayPal, and here's the intro. You see, this is where you can come. You can go to the homepage, you can go to the intro, you can go to different links uh, where all the videos are, the whole nine yards. And don't forget the, the support, it's, it's not, the, the bulk of it has nothing to do with supporting just the family here and in the and the in the portion here of the ministry. We have also the ministry, of course, um, that our brother Steve is running out with some of his brothers over there in Uganda. And man, guys, we have sent the not sent. We have sent the support where they have now purchased. I believe it's significantly over, or at least a little bit over now, two thousand Bibles. They've printed, I. I think they're getting close now to somewhere around a thousand of the ministry revealed books. So, you know, is it about the ministry revealed book? No, 
But what happens is when you grow in the word and people are coming to Christ and they're seeking and they're diligent, and they really want to draw closer and understand them. They need to be fed. What would be a better place than to have the understanding of these differences right off the bat? To be able to learn and see what these mysteries are. And why is it more important now than ever? Because we are preparing a people. Whether they're going to remain to work as a, as a remnant worker portion or whether they're going pre-trip. Do you know how many people come to Christ and then just live out their daily life like it's just everything's normal? There's not enough time for that. Yes, we still have to be doing things in life. We still have to get things done, right? This group, we know more than ever, more than probably just about any other group or just as much as many other end time watchers that we tend to throw things on the back burner, right? And push things out a little more and push things out until things get a little dilapidated, right? But there are things we still have to get done, right? We st we're still living in this life. And I know for some people, we're, we're afraid that if, if we do those things that need to get done, we might get pulled away and, and just say, ah, and, and get caught up in the things of this world. But if you're always praying, you're seeking him, you're diligent. I'm here. We're here in this ministry. We're here in the forum. We'll be here watching and praying. You can always come back. You can check in every day. You can check in every few days. You can say hello. We'll continue to be strengthening everybody that comes, that the Spirit leads. So don't fear that. I know there are things that have to get done. I do this. This is, this is my calling. This is what I am chosen to do. So, of course, I'm involved in doing it every day. But I know that there are still things that people have to get done. And for some people, it's not an issue. For others, sometimes it can be. And, and I go into that category sometimes, too. I've gotten better with it over the years. But, you know, are we, are we, do we, does that mean we don't believe that the time is at hand just because, you know, we still have to get other things done? No. Does it mean we're not watching? No, of course not. Right? There's been, we've, we've had enough experience with, with days coming and days going that we had high watches for. Do I think this one's going to come and go? That by late May into June, sometime in June, that, that this isn't it? No, I, I believe it with all my heart. But do I know it for a fact? No, I can't 100% say for a fact that it is. Can I say 100% for a fact of the revelation of the gospels uh, of the 14 years and it's because of Matthew and all that it led to? Absolutely, Though that's, not, that's undeniable. It is an absolute and it's 100%. But we always have to be watching, praying and diligently seeking guys. <clears throat> and all you got to do is incorporate, incorporate it into your daily life. All right. So let me start with this reminder always as well. This is exactly what I was talking about a moment ago. You know, it's Ecclesiastes 1.9, and I also shared it in the intro to the intro series. The thing that has been, so was, Old Testament, is that which shall be. And that which is done, which is New Testament from Christ until the preacher of escape is that which shall be done. So was, shall be, is, shall be. Which means what you're going to have to understand and what you're going to have to learn to see are what's called types and shadows. Because clearly the things of the Old Testament and the way they lived and the way their wars and their battles and everything were, well, of course, they're not going to be the exact same way. The things that happened in the time of Christ and the way it played out in their seasons and what they did and it's not going to be the same. Yet, there's nothing new under the sun, and what was shall be, and what is shall be. What is that telling us? You got it. There's only one answer to that. Both play out in what's called the is to come. Their typologies, their types and shadows are revealed in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament, and will play out prophetically. But these are things that played out over thousands of years. We don't have thousands of years in the tribulation. It's a portion of 50 days and, a, and 14 years. And if you're new and you're hearing 50 days and 14 years, well, there, there's videos on that. Okay? It is the revelation of the is to come. 
and you're going to see it laid out throughout the Gospels like most of you have never seen before. Most of you, many of you here that have been around for a while, you'll have seen many of these things. You'll have understood many of these things, if not most of them. But those that are newer or a little bit newer, or even if they've been around for a year or two, you may not have heard of a lot of these. Okay? That's how much we're going to cover. But here is the beginning of the revelation of the 14 years to understand what was and what is that have played out over thousands of years are going to play out in a portion called above 14 years. Okay? What is this typology? This is Paul coming back as if he's coming the third time. That's the whole conversation. And what do you get? There's a group in Christ above 14 years ago. This, this is Paul giving us a typology of him in Christ above 14 years ago. Okay? It's not a rapture, but the word such and one means like a rapture. This rapture, this like a rapture goes to the third heaven. This is the Luke group. The Romans 8, those in Christ, spirit-filled. Then I knew such a man. This such a man is the same word for like, like such an one caught up. This means it's not a man like this first one was in Christ, but, you know, kind of, sort of. This is the rapture group, was caught up to paradise. This rapture takes place in the seventh year of seals in the seventh year of tribulation. This first one is going above 14 years. That's the portion that we believe late May to early June this year at the true end of 70, okay? When you go down and you see what Paul goes on to say, he's talking about what? Behold, I'm ready to come to you the third time. You see? And it says, I will not be burdensome to you. I seek not yours, but you. This is to the Jews. He's a typology in Christ here. So you, what do you have? You have a taking, a taking, and a returning, a coming. This is played out everywhere. These first two, the third heaven and paradise, they're part of the kingdom of God. This is the Mark group, the bride going to the third heaven, right? The bride and the guests and so forth. This is the third heaven. This is Luke's group. This is the Mark group, the was caught up, the Revelation 12:5. This is the was caught up. They are the ones going to paradise, which is part of the kingdom of God. And then this is when the Lord returns feet down, coming to them the third time when everything's done. And what's he doing? He is now coming to them. Everything will now be his. He's returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. And now he's not bringing any burden to them. What's he going to do? He's now here until the end of the world. So where would this be connected to? Well, this if it's talking to the Jews, it's talking to Matthew's portion. It, it, it's foundational. That's why that intro series is so important and such a big deal. It is truly going to blow your mind. I don't say that, you know, just flippantly. I, I mean it with all of my heart. It will truly, truly bless you and continue to bless you. Is it all because of me? Nope. It doesn't have a single thing to do with me. It is the leading of the Spirit. The Spirit just doesn't, I don't get voices. I don't hear, here it is, here it is, here it is. Oh, there it is. I just read and I've understood. I've been, I've been tasked with this and I call it the leading of the Holy Ghost. It is Spirit led, not Spirit given. All right? But the fantastic part about it is when you realize that it's the Father in the Son, right through the Son that instructed the Holy Ghost to say, release it. To me, that only says one thing, that the time is near, that the time is near. Sure, I'm a vessel, but I'm only one of many for many different things, as many of you are for your families and those that you're around. This is my purpose. I can't wait to see what comes next in his presence with all of you. So, so exciting. Even to contemplate that we're actually in the range of it really, truly happening. Never having tasted of death. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's so awesome. It's over the top awesome, isn't it? Well, today in this, I'm going to do my best to try to at least follow the tabs that I have opened. Of course, I've got 
you know, pretty much the whole slew of tabs open. I think I can hold 70 tabs. And I'm going to do my best to just kind of follow my tabs for the most part and kind of veer off here and there because, <laughs> as you guys know, I can, I can do this in my sleep with this. But I want to kind of keep it relatively consistent in how I'm following it. So let me show you an example. This is in Luke chapter 13. Uh, sorry, in Luke chapter 23. I know you guys know this. You guys all know it like the back of your hands. What you see is when, you see, remember what I said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the end of days, the last will be first, the first will be last. So it starts with Luke, then it's Mark, then it's Matthew. That's the end of days revelation. And what you see is in Luke, Jesus was arrayed in a gorgeous robe. The gorgeous robe is white, radiant, gorgeous, beautiful. Okay, sounds like a bride, right? What you find out in Mark is in Mark, he was clothed in purple. When you go to Matthew, in Matthew, you see that he was arrayed in scarlet. Okay, scarlet. What do we know about this without having to go to the scriptures? We know that white is a bride color, right? Gorgeous, beautiful white. And purple and scarlet are what? They're tribulation colors, right? Just like the woman riding the beast in Revelation 17. Purple and scarlet are the tribulation colors, okay? What would it have meant? What would it have meant that he was arrayed in, in white and gorgeous here and purple here and in scarlet there? It can't be perspective. They weren't colorblind. There was a purpose to these color differences within the Synoptic Gospels. This is what it is. Pre, mid, post, it's showing you the different groups. One of the other ones that's fantastic is the one in the same chapter. Let's go back to Luke. And it's what Jesus says at the crucifixion. At the crucifixion, Jesus says, only in Luke, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. How many of you guys have heard of that? In fact, when it comes to the differences in the robes, when I, I've said it many times in the past, you ask pastors about the differences in the robes, and they'll say, what differences? They all just think scarlet. Because the whole world has been taught from the foundation of Matthew. And of course, if you don't understand the, the differences within the Gospels, then the easiest thing to do is just stick to Matthew. And look at the other ones as just little adding points. That's why when you go to seminary, I remember this years ago, one of our brothers in Vancouver in Canada, <clears throat> he had been to seminary and he, he did, a, I think it was five years seminary school. And I had talked about, I bet you if you go look at your notes, you'll see that about 90% of everything gospel related in your, in your schooling is probably from the gospel of Matthew. You'll find maybe like probably eight, nine you know, nine or so percent is probably from Mark. And you'd be hard pressed to find much from Luke. One, two percent of all your studies probably have anything to do with Luke. And when he came back, he called me up after digging through his, his boxes of notes. And he says, wouldn't you know it? He says, virtually everything was Matthew. There was very little Mark, but he says he only found, I think, a couple pieces of paper that actually had anything Luke on it. You see? Is it, is it because the church is so wrong and the seminaries, oh, they're so bad? No. The Lord had it planned this way. It's part of the purpose and part of the plan. And you know what's pretty amazing about it? Is when you realize, as we go to touch into other things that are only found in Luke's gospel, and you see the differences in it, you're going to realize that the whole thing is based on God's harvest. You see, if you take this whole screen here and you just said it was a field, now, now, each harvest has the same concept, but the overall big picture of the earth is like looking at the entire screen of, of, uh, of the screen here in the video, and about 10%, the middle portion, 10%, is what goes first to the Lord. Only 10%. That's the bride of Christ. Then you've got the 90% that remains of which like 85, 88%, some high number like that of the 90 that remains, about 85, 88, somewhere in there, of the 90% that remains is the main harvest. 
And that remaining two, three, four, five percent are the corners and the gleaning of what falls along the way. The entire story is the Lord God's harvest model. So if, if this had been understood and it was revealed and it had been known for hundreds of years, the Lord's entire harvest model would be shot. You see, so was it planned? Was it purposed? Or is it the fact that the father knew? That's why he told us his harvest model, right? First fruits, main harvest, corners and gleaning. In the model is the pre, the mid, the post. Pretty fantastic, isn't it? And what is that? Luke, Mark, Matthew. So what does he say here? He says, Father, into your arms, I, uh, into your hands, I commend my spirit. I won't go into Mark and Matthew just to save a little time. But in Mark and Matthew, it's the exact same thing. And everybody knows it. Right? Where he says, oops, where am I? In Mark 15, verse 34, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The word forsaken, you guessed it, to leave behind. Did Jesus at any point believe he was being left behind? Of course not. Not even for a glimpse, not even for a moment of a second did he believe he was being left behind. So which words did he say? <laughs> you see? Uh, which words did he say? Oh, I'm sure he probably said both. But what's the purpose of having these differences? Yet Mark and Matthew have the same wording, but Luke doesn't. Because it is the revelation of the end of days. Purple and scarlet are tribulation colors. The two saying leave behind are Mark and Matthew, those going through seals and trumpets. You see, remember, if you follow the ministry or if you've been around for at least a little bit, you understand that when Jerusalem is attacked, so there's a 50-day period of events that take place first. We're not going to go into that. But when the 14 years begin, when the 50 days end and the 14 years start, it's going to begin with the destruction on Jerusalem. You see it in Jeremiah 4. It's all over the place. You see it in Zechariah 1. Many, many places talk about it. You see it in Luke chapter 21 in his discourse. They're going to be compassed about and then they're going to be destroyed. So what happens during those seven, first seven years of seals? Judah is removed from the land. They're going to be in captivity. They're going to be uh, in the mountains, in the wilderness. You know, th this is their first seven years that's going to take place. Like they're going to be removed. So that the Lord God can have his land rest because they never allowed it to rest since they've had it with Jerusalem. You see, and while they're scattered. The Lord is going to deal with the world, which is the Mark group, which is the church, the world, the Gentiles grafted into the house of Israel. That is the first seven years of seals in it. You have World War three nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom that will start with the destruction of Jerusalem. Then you're going to have the Antichrist show up on the scene. You're going to have then Mark's discourse and fleeing into the wilderness for the, for the world, for the church, when he comes into power. Then you got the Lord coming at the end of the first six years of seals. And what happens? The rapture of the great multitude in the seventh year. That'll be the main harvest. It's fantastic. But then what happens? After the rapture comes in, the Jews recognized what? Well, the Jews will recognize that their savior, who is Christ, is going to what? Destroy their enemies that destroyed them. He's going to come and he's going to start setting up to the rebuilding of the new temple. Do you see how this confused the world? The church with the Jews, everybody will tell you the Jews are going to fall for the Antichrist. No, they're not. The Jews recognize that the one coming to rebuild is their Messiah because he is. With the modern day Zerubbabel, the Lord will be there in, on heavenly Mount Zion as high priest and king. It's, it's so mind-blowing to know. And that will begin the seven years of trumpets. It's so crazy. So like I said, you've got Mark and you've got Matthew talking about being left behind. How about this one? In Luke chapter 14, this is always a, a fun one. You don't find it in Mark. You find none of it in Mark. 
what do we see in Luke chapter 14? Well, we see the story of a wedding feast and we see, so they're parables, right? The parable of the wedding feast and the parable of the great banquet. Mark has no wedding story. There is no parable of a wedding feast and there's no great banquet. And when you go to Matthew, you do find a parable of a wedding feast. And in Matthew's wedding feast, it's very different than Luke's wedding feast. And for example, let's go to where, uh, where was Matthew's? I think Matthew's is, at first I was thinking 14, but I think it's 20 or 22. There we go, 22, I got it. You see, here's another wedding feast. And this one is very much different. It's called the kingdom of heaven in Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse two. The kingdom is of heaven is likened unto a certain king which, a marriage, which made a marriage for his son. This one is completely different than the one you read about in Luke. And what is this one connected to? The kingdom of heaven. Now, scholars and, and people just reading the scriptures have understood for a long time that there's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Some don't think there's a difference and will just read it as if it's the same thing, but it, it absolutely is not. You see, the wedding feast, when you see here in Luke chapter 14, and you got the wedding feast starting in uh, verse 7, you know, I say it all the time, sit in the lowest room, these are guests going up. Wait, you know, and if you're a friend of the Lord, he'll call you up to go up higher. And what happens in this one? Well, as you read it, when this wedding story is over, you realize what happened. Well, what do we know about Luke? What, what do we call everybody going pre-trip? The bride of Christ. What kind of bride of Christ? The Gentile bride of Christ. What was Luke? Luke just so happened to be a Gentile. Okay, the Gentile bride of Christ, the, the typology hidden within Luke's differences is to the pre-trib bride of Christ in a remnant worker portion. So what wedding is this? This is the pre-trib wedding. This is the Gentile bride wedding. And what happens after this wedding? Well, we know in the 50 days, the Lord is gonna return, right? Within the 50 days, the pre-trib happens at the beginning of the 50. The Lord returns after the wedding. So when seven days are done on the eighth day, and what's he going to do? He's going to meet with that remnant portion that he said to gird themselves up to remain until he returns after the wedding. Okay, this is a special group that are going to put their necks on the line. They're going to be resurrected to rule and reign with him in the millennial reign at the end of tribulation. That's why you have this conversation here. That's why you don't have this banquet feast being mentioned in Mark or Matthew. Because this one is the one for his remnant workers who would have been a part of the accounted worthy to go to that pre-trib wedding. But they've been chosen to remain and follow him to be girded about when he returns to warn as Jonah did because the Son of Man is coming for 40 days after the escape and after the wedding. He's going to sit down. He's going to serve them. And that's the conversation going on here. The one going on in Matthew. And you'll notice that you have what? Here's the one in Luke. In Luke 14, uh, verse 15. Right? Eat bread in the kingdom of God. So he's talking to the banquet, that remnant worker portion. It's all connected to the kingdom of God. When you go to Matthew 22 and you go to Matthew's wedding, you see that this wedding is connected to what? In Matthew 22, verse two, the kingdom of heaven. What's the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? You guessed it, we just covered it earlier, right? Those, those going to the kingdom of heaven are those, or sorry, to the kingdom of God are those going, they're, they're the world, they're the pre-trib, right? The, 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 even the great multitude rapture, but they're going to the paradise portion. It's, it's in heaven. You ever notice why the Jews don't talk about going to heaven? You'll even hear some Jews 
and you've probably even heard it said by pastors or even heard it from the lips of Jews that they don't believe in heaven. They don't believe they go to heaven or even that some of them don't even believe in heaven. Why? Because it's not theirs. It was given to others. You see, theirs isn't the kingdom of God. Sorry, I don't, I don't want to get that confused. Theirs is not the kingdom of God. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? It's going to be heaven on earth. It's going to be when the Lord returns feet down and everything in heaven and on earth is now his and he is now here until the end of the world. That is the kingdom of heaven. That's the difference between them both. It's, it's so, I say it all the time, that it's so incredible to, to understand, but it truly, truly, truly is. Let me show you another one. One we've also spoken about. Even in the intro video. Let's go to Mark chapter 9. I won't spend a lot of time here, but the stuff around it is, is awesome. Because we're going to come back to Mark chapter 9 more than once. Because the, the stuff that's in it from uh, all over it, but from uh, Luke 9, 26 through till verse 36. And when you go to the same story of the transfiguration in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, <laughs> the detail that is found in there is absolutely over the top. Because we'll realize when you go to the video and you go to the other videos within the intro series on the youtube channel in that playlist and you get to the pre mid and post uh revelation you're going to see that within the story of the resurrection of luke mark and matthew within the story of the triumphal entry of luke mark and matthew and within the story of the transfigurations of luke mark and matthew is the story of the Lord coming pre, mid, post. Or, or just after pre, coming for 40 days, and then at the end of, uh, uh, for the seventh year of seals, and for the seventh year of trumpets. It's that fantastic. You're going to see it all over. It is all in threes. Spirit, light, flesh, Holy Ghost, Son, Father, Matt, uh, Luke, Mark, Matthew, pre, mid, post. It's everywhere. And it's awesome when you see it. Even the creations, you're going to see that there were three creations from Genesis 1 into Genesis 2. It's, and, and, and the revelation of it is Luke, Mark, Matthew. It's that fantastic. So here's a big one that people have noticed the obvious difference in. So in Luke 9, 28, again, we just recently covered it, so I won't spend a lot of time. But in the Transfiguration story, in verse 1, in uh, 9, 28, uh, sorry, in Luke 9, verse 28, it says, And it came to pass about an eight days after these, after these sayings. Well, after what sayings? Well, the sayings that were just above it. So, something happened eight days before, approximately eight days before. What, what happened approximately eight days before? Well, if you realize, when you have end-time eyes and you can begin to see this, you're going to realize that the story within the transfiguration of Luke, Mark, and Matthew is when the Lord comes to begin his 40 days of the Son of Man during those 50 days. You're going to see it relates to the Lord coming at the end of, uh, in the seventh year of seals, and when he comes at the seventh year of trumpets. So what are you seeing about this about an eight days? Well, we covered it in the previous video. It not only means the eighth day, like the wedding, right? The wedding is what? Seven days. When the seven days are over, what's he coming? His remnant bride, right? That remnant worker portion that is now going to be here, that is girded about, that he's going to have a meal with. And they're going to follow him, and then they'll remain at least during seals times. But what happened before these eight days that says after these sayings? Because you know what? Not only is about an eighth day different than Mark and Matthew's, but so is the wording after these sayings. So what came before these sayings? Listen to this, verse 27. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Pretty awesome, right? There's going to be a group of people on the earth that will not taste of death 
How exciting is that? So much so that the next thing they're going to see is the kingdom of God. That's how quick it's going to happen. When the pre-trib moment happens, those who are still alive, not having yet experienced death, the next thing they're going to see is the kingdom of God. This is the pre-trib group being taken out. It's fantastic. When does it happen? It happens before what? Well, not only does this represent the Son of Man coming in the typology to start his 40 days at about an eighth day when he returns seven days after the wedding, but there's also a year type to it. And what does that mean in relation to being a year type? Well, the big story, as we've got videos on this, the big picture story is that it's seven, 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 and one. Book of Revelation, 22 chapters. Uh, um, it's uh, the Hebrew alphabet. It's the story of creation. But the, 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 the mystery is this first seven. It's just shortened by, it, it's only a small period of time represented by two verses in Genesis 1 and verse 1 and 2. But the representation is really, there was a period of seven years, 7,000, seven days, and this is what we're in right now. So it's the preparation. This is why we're saying it, it's the preparation of the bride. It's the waking up. It, it's preparing a remnant bride worker as well. Not only uh, um, those prepare, helping to prepare others to, to get ready and to be watching and praying and diligent in the Lord and repentant, but also a group who's being prepared for when the Lord comes and opens their understanding to be ready to work. So you see, the big picture is actually seven years, seven years, and seven years. So in Luke's portion, it says what? It says about an eight days. So it's not quite what? Days as years? It's not quite the eighth year. It's, it, it's in the neighborhood. It's right around there. It's just about the eighth day or the eighth year in the big picture. Which means what? When the next portion starts, you have what? Six days or six years. So when we take this to Mark's story, in Mark chapter 9, and it says in verse 2, and after six days, this is the Lord coming at the end of the first six years of seals, at the start of the seventh year of seals. You see? So what do you see at the end of the sixth seal? The end of the sixth seal, oops, the end of the sixth seal in the bigger picture is the end of the first 13 years, but really it's the first six years of seals. And at the end of the sixth seal, what do we see? We see the Lord coming, right? The Lord's coming on something. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. Then you see the 144,000 sealed. You see the, uh, the rapture of the great multitude in the seventh year of seals. And then what happens? Without going to Matthew chapter 17, in Matthew chapter 17, you see what? Then you see after six years, or after six days, which is the six years from the start of trumpets. And what happens at that point? In that transfiguration story, you've got the story of the Lord returning, the typology of him coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's the end of the 13 years of tribulation when the Lord will have returned now at the end of the 13th, start of the 14th, returned feet down on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, destroying the enemies. You see? It's, these are the mysteries tied into it all. Watch this. Remember when we were in Luke chapter 9, in Luke chapter 9, verse 27, we saw that this group here that will not taste of death, bang, until they see the kingdom of God, that's the very next thing they're going to see. This group right here is the Luke chapter 21, Luke's discourse, verse 36, that says, watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. 
That's this group right here. In fact, check this out. Let me show you this pic these pictures. Remember when I, when I was reading from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12? We saw there was a pre, a mid, a post, right? One that goes to the third heaven, one that goes to paradise, and the other one is the Lord returning, feet down on the Mount of Olives. They're the ones that will get the city, right? They're the ones that will be part of the millennial reign. And look at what it says. This is the fragment from um, the Apocrypha book. I think it's from the Church Fathers. Um, and it says, As the elders say, then those who are deemed worthy of, a, of an abode in heaven will go there. Others will enjoy the delights of paradise, and others will possess the splendor of the city. For everywhere the Savior will be seen, according as they be worthy who see him. But there is this distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold and that of those who produce sixtyfold and that of those that produce thirtyfold. For the first will be taken up into the heavens, the second class will dwell in paradise, and the last will inhabit the city. You see that? Pretty darn clear, isn't it? It's the same story from 1 Corinthians, uh, sorry, from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's pre, mid, post. It is absolutely everywhere. So what do we see here? A group that bang, the next thing they're going to see is the kingdom of God. What happens when we go into Mark 9? In Mark 9, verse starting in verse 1, before the, that sixth year comes to an end as days, it says, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you that there be some uh, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. You see this? This is a past tense word phrase. You didn't get that in Luke. This this should be a discrepancy, and it is a discrepancy. Not only the verse after, which is you know from about an eight days compared to after six and after six clearly a discrepancy well it's a mystery now revealed for the end of days so what's the purpose why does luke's group bang the next thing they're going to see bang is the kingdom of god that's because when it happens bang they're gone pre-trib it's happened what about this one why does it say in mark 1 till they have seen meaning they will have seen the kingdom of god coming but they didn't get to go right away? How on earth does that make any sense? Till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. How does that make any sense? Well, guess what? We already talked about it. Revelation chapter 6. At the end of the first six years of seals, what happens? Right? In verse 15 and 16 of Revelation 6, they all hide us, right? Every island, everything's moved. The rich men, poor men, everybody's hiding in the mountains and rocks. And say, and in verse 16, it says, And said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall abide to stand? Who shall be able to stand? What's happening? They're seeing him come. They're seeing him come on heavenly Mount Zion. But what the world of churches told you that if, if they even teach on prophecy in the churches you go to, what those that teach on prophecy tell you is most of them will sandwich seals and trumpets together. They will sandwich them over each other and say that seal, first seal, first trumpet, second seal, second trumpet, that they're all happening together. And one of the main reasons they have to do that, well, there's more than one. But of course, if you only see everything in seven years, well, that's what you have to do. You have to mix and mash everything together. Otherwise, there's no way it'll, it'll make sense to fit. But the other reason they do it is because they see the Lord here. They see the Lord and the wrath of the Lord coming. So they think, well, if this is the wrath of the Lord coming at the end of the sixth seal and you go to the end of the sixth trumpet and you go to the start of the seventh trumpet, at the start of the seventh trumpet, everything is now the Lord's and so on and so forth. But they, what they failed to realize is that the Lord has two battles. And we're told this in Scripture. He has two battles to fight, right? Whether it's the Father on the last one, you know, whatever you want to say. But there are two wars coming with Jesus and the Father against the enemies. And that's what hasn't been understood. 
So what you're seeing here, and we're going to cover that in a little bit, it's, you, you see it in, uh, in Luke's gospel, uh, the, the beginning of the revelation. It's a great little story about it. And then you see it in um, Zechariah chapter 14. It tells you the exact details of it. So what you're seeing here is when the Lord's coming at the end of the sixth seal. So when we were in Mark chapter 9, verse 2 said, and after six days, and verse 1 said that, you know, they will have seen him come. Right? They will have seen the kingdom of God come. Well, here he's coming. But guess what? They're not like the pre-trib group that, bang, they get to go. It wasn't instant. It's not like, bang, they see it and they get to go. Look at this. They're all seeing it. Everybody is seeing it and they're hiding. But when does the rapture happen? When does the great multitude rapture happen? Right away? Nope. Verse uh, chapter 7 of Revelation starts with 144,000 being sealed. You have to understand the simplicity of this by realizing that after the sixth seal and before the seventh seal, the 144,000 are being sealed and the rapture of the great multitude happens. So anybody that tries to tell you that this rapture of the great multitude in Revelation 7 is pre-trib, it's, they're just they're deceiving themselves or they're just not paying attention to the fact that it's after the sixth seal. Hello. Right. Some people will try to tell you that the seals have already taken place throughout the last several decades and we're just waiting on the sixth seal. And that's the Lord coming for the great multitude rapture. No, it's not true. Do you see why this isn't so this is so important within the revelation of the Gospels? This is the stuff that fires me up because now I can go into detailed conversations about this. You see, because in Luke, in his transfiguration, we just saw what? Bang, the next thing you're going to see is the kingdom of God. But Marx said you're going to, you will have seen it come. But you still didn't get to go yet. This is the group right here. It's not till somewhere approximately in the seventh year of seals, about the midpoint, give or take, of seals, of the seventh seal, I should say, or sorry, sorry, of the seventh year of seals, somewhere around the midpoint of that year is when the great multitude rapture will have all come in. Where does this group go? They go to paradise. You see, it's the absolute evidence of what Mark chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 are telling us. Isn't that awesome? I think it's so fantastic. Well, now let's go to, uh, that was Mark. Let's go to Matthew. And in Matthew, we'll start in verse 17. Then you got to go to the end of 16. In Matthew chapter uh, 17, verse 1, it says, after six days. All right, and I've said it a dozen times, you know. I remember for a long time, I understood the Mark after six and the Matthew after six. But the mystery for the longest time was the Luke one. And when I came to understand that about, I don't know, maybe three and a half, four years ago, man, I was so excited. It was such an incredible revelation to understand it. Just like the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. When you realize that at the end of the sixth seal, at the end of six years of the first six years of seals, and there's one more year to go, the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. Everybody's freaking out. What's going to happen? There's going to be the war. It's going to be the Gog Magog war of Ezekiel, uh, of Ezekiel 39. Isn't it fascinating that the world of church will tell you most of them think that that's what's coming first? Why do you think? Because they only see the final seven years. They're missing the first seven. That's how awesome it is. It's, you see, in, like I said, we're going to see the two places that talk about the swords, the battles that the Lord's going to do. And it's told to us in Luke. <laughs> it's phenomenal. Let's go back one chapter in Matthew 16 and see what his wording says. Let's start in Matthew 16, verse 27, 28. Remember, this is the same kind of wording as going to Mark 1 and, uh, and Luke 27. Okay, it's right at this time when he's coming and there's this wording, right? For the end of the six, end of the six, and just about the eighth, or just about the eighth, six and six, right? So it says uh, 27 and 28, Matthew 16. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, 
And then shall he reward every man according to his works. Wasn't that fantastic? Do you know what happens when you go to Revelation chapter 11? Go to Revelation chapter 11, you get to the seventh trumpet, which is the seventh year of trumpets. Right? What's going to happen? He's going to what? Give reward unto his servants, the prophets, and the saints, and them that fear his name. What, what is the seventh trumpet? The beginning of the seventh year of trumpets. It doesn't mean it's one year per seal or one year per trumpet. That's not what it means. It just means by the end of the sixth seal being done, the six years of seals are done. By the end of the sixth trumpet, the six years of trumpets are done. And there's still one more year of seals and one more year of trumpets, of which the Lord destroys the enemy, reestablishes things, get things set up. It's absolutely incredible. And as much as they sound like, oh, six and one, six and one, well, maybe they are on top of each other. They are not. The entire storyline is revealed when you understand who the Gospels are speaking to. So here we are again. Where do we see that the people get rewarded? The seventh year of trumpets. When is he going to reward every man for his work? There it is. When he comes at the seventh trumpet, right at the end of six years of six days of trumpets. And then Matthew 16, verse 28 says, Verily I say unto you that there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Did you, did, did you read that in Mark and Luke? Not at all. There was no seeing him coming in his kingdom. When is he going to be seen coming in his kingdom? When he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives as lightning from one end unto the other, when the whole world will see him. Hello. Where do you think you find the context within the resurrection stories of somebody showing up like lightning? Or which discourse do you think you find the story of him coming like lightning? The answer is always Matthew. It's always Matthew. You see? Till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Why would he come in his kingdom? Because now everything in heaven and on earth is now his, and now he's going to be here. What? You heard it already. Because now he's going to be here with them until the end of the world. I told you it's awesome. <laughs> it's so exciting, guys. It's just, it's beautiful. And we're going to come back to some more things within that transfiguration story, the, the, that whole portion of the transfiguration story, because it is loaded. Well. Let's go to another piece. Let's go to one that I, I wanted to get to within the, uh, the intro to the intro videos or the intro video to the intro series in relation to the discourses. Okay, the discourses have so many things. But as I told you, if you want to watch the discourses one, right now you can find it. There's one simple. As I mentioned in the beginning, in the, Revel in the Revealed End Time Study Notes series, you can find it right here, the sixth video, The Discourse is Revealed. So you can really go into a lot more detail there. I, I could do literally, I mean, it's a two and a half hour video of just of that alone, alone. There's so much detail, all right? But let me show you one that I wanted to include in it, but I just, for time's sakes, I, I just couldn't get it in. This is one, again, we all know this one. In Luke... Chapter 21, verse 27, and this is all about the coming of the Son of Man. You see, this, this is why these things have baffled people, because when you read the discourses, even though Luke's discourse is completely different than Mark or Matthew's, and some have acknowledged the fact that it seems to be a separate period of time, but never understood. We know what it means here. Okay, it relates to the 40, 50 days that begin everything. Mark's and Matthew's is the seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. But what's really caused the issue is that all three of them have a coming of the Son of Man. How on earth is that possible? How is this possible? 
There's only one way it's possible. Pre, mid, and post. You see? Pre, mid, and post. That's why there's been so many debates and arguments as to which is true, pre, mid, or post. You know, and then some people say, oh, it can't be all three. You can't fit all three in seven years. Yeah. Hallelujah. You're right. Let me show you how you can and how it is going to happen. It's over 14 years and plus 50 days, right? Well, listen to what it says. Of course, Luke's is very different, right? To the point where men's hearts are going to fail them for fear of looking after those things that are coming upon the earth. Could you even imagine, guys? Do you realize that this wording here in Luke chapter 21, 25 through 28, is what we're expecting to begin to take place? What are we? The sixth? We're expecting this to take place within the next one, two, three, within the next four to five weeks. This conversation in Luke 21, verse 25 through 28, is what we're expecting to begin. Isn't that crazy? Crazy, crazy, crazy. Men's hearts failing them for fear of looking after those things which are coming on the earth. I believe that relates to the meteor, which is why you only see Jesus talk about being a stone's throw away only in Luke's gospel. Because the stone's throw is going to be part of the beginning of it all. At the escape of the bride of Christ, there's going to be a stone's throw, a meteor coming. Does it break down? Does it become a whole bunch of pieces? I have no idea, but it would appear so because what on earth is going to be so coming down from above that men's hearts are going to fail them, that they're going to die of heart attacks right there in the streets? Pretty crazy, right? Well, listen to what it says in verse 27. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Okay, the word in means in, so that's good. But the word cloud is singular. Is everybody going to see him coming in this cloud? Of course not. Only those that are his. Only that remnant, ready, watching, praying, diligent bride, that Luke white arrayed garment prepared for them, those are the ones that are going to see him. Look at this when you get to Mark. I know for many of you guys, most of you, you've all seen this. I know it. But it's just so beautiful. You see, the coming of the Son of Man. Well, look what Mark 13, 24 starts with. But in those days, after that tribulation. <laughs> after that tribulation. Did you read any of that in Luke? Nope. So what happens in this one? Well, in, verse thir in, in Mark 13, verse 26, it says, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, okay, it's still the word in, the clouds. It's now plural. It's now plural clouds. Hello. Luke was in a singular cloud, so the whole world isn't going to see him. He's going to be in the cloud. And only those who are his are going to see him. Well, what about in Mark's group? Not everybody's going to see him. He's in the clouds, plural, when he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He's not going to be seen by everybody coming. They're going to see what's coming, and the world is going to freak out and panic. We just read that in Revelation 6. This is that timing in Mark 13. This is the Lord at the end of the sixth seal. Pretty crazy. Well, guess what? When you come to Matthew, in Matthew's discourse, chapter 24, <clears throat> And we go to the story of the Son of Man coming. You got it. What does it say? Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So you see what the distinguishing word was in Mark, right? Immediately after that tribulation. Right? Or after that tribulation. In Matthew, it's immediately after the tribulation of those days. You see that? And then what? Then shall the sign of the Son of Man appear, verse 30, halfway through, all the tribes of the earth mourn. Uh, uh, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. 
Well, now, wait a second. That sounds just like Marx. But when you have the Strong's Concordance at your fingertips, like a program like this called ESORD, and you get the KJV plus, so you get all the word definitions at your fingertips. Well, we saw that Luke, he was coming in a singular cloud. In Mark, we saw that he was coming in plural clouds. And then we go to Matthew, it's in, but it's not really in. You see the word in is 1722. It means in, but this one in Matthew is actually 1909. What does it mean? On. So in Matthew 24, 30, this is the Lord, the Son of Man, coming on the clouds, plural. Uh, well, isn't that interesting? What did we read in Matthew 16? In Matthew 16, verse 28, the last verse, it says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Hello. You see that? Till they see him coming in his kingdom. When is his kingdom? When he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Do you see the evidence in relation to the end, in relation to the discourses, in relation to the, the typology, the, the, the types and shadows within the Gospels? I mean, just look at this one from Luke, Mark, and Matthew within the transfiguration and the story just before it, the verse before it. Till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. They're not going to the kingdom of God. They're seeing it come and then they're going. But they don't know when because they will have already seen it. And then there's going to be a time when they're going. Completely lines up to the book of Revelation. I love this stuff. It is so incredible. I'm sorry. I know you're going to hear me repeat those things throughout every once in a while. But it just blows my mind. It is so impactful to be able to see it um what's another piece let's go to this part part in luke 19 we'll do some more within the discourses though too like i said i don't want to spend too much in there though you know another one we're not going to go into this really here tonight as well but another one is the triumphal entry okay you, you'll see it in the triumphal entry we're we're not going to touch on this tonight but you see it in the triumphal entry um as a as a pre-mid post again but when we get to uh the resurrection story you're going to see this pre-mid and post based on just just a slight difference in wording that it's always what it is <laughs> so much so that you don't even realize that it's an actual difference that's how powerful it is but listen to what he says here this is a story in luke 19 starting in verse 41 that is only in Luke's gospel. You see, there are things that are in all three. There are things that are in only two of them. There are things that are only in one of them. The question is why? Right? Why? There is a reason every single time with the end time eyes, with seeing in the is to come. And so what does it read in Luke 19 verse 41? And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. <clears throat> you see? Remember what the story is. The story of the triumphal entry is another typology. When you go into the video about it, of the pre, mid, and post video, you're going to see it's another story of him coming to begin his 40 days. When he comes to begin his 40 days, what's he doing? He's doing as Jonah. He said he would. He said he's going to do as Jonah did. What's he going to do? He's going to be a warning. Just as he said in Luke. That's why that version in Luke is the one for 40 days, to be as Jonah was. So what is the typology? He's about to come and weep over Jerusalem. In, 19, uh, in Luke 19, verse 42, continuing, it says, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. You see? This is where the Lord has had enough. The Father's like, eh, that's it. Destruction is coming upon you. Your warning has come. When you see yourself getting compassed about, you had better get out. Because this is the time that all things will now begin to be fulfilled. And what's going to happen to the Jews? 
for their disobedience, he's going to hide it from their eyes. And that's why we know many crazy things are going to happen, right? That's why the discourses tell us, in, in the middle point of Mark, in the middle point time frames of Matthew, it says it's going to be worse than it ever was in human history. The one for Mark is because of the coming of the Antichrist at that point. <clears throat> the one in Matthew is even worse than the one in Mark's. And the reason is because at that point, the one in Matthew's, that abomination is when the pit is open, when Antichrist is brought back, and Satan has also been cast down. Yikes. Do you imagine that? So it's going to be a time worse than ever on the earth. So back to Luke 19, 43. Then he says, For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round about, come, encompass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Do you know what this story is? This story right here, <coughs> excuse me, is 100% the story in Luke chapter 21 when Jesus as the Son of Man is here. He's not running around saying, I'm Jesus. He is the Son of Man. He's going to be doing signs, wonders. He's going to be doing miracles. He's going to be warning. The world is going to think he's the Antichrist. And when he's gone after 40 days, they're probably going to say, uh, uh, I thought the Antichrist was here for seven years or something. You see? What is that from Luke chapter 19? And why is it only found in Luke? Because it's the one connected to Luke's discourse in the end times. It says, starting in Luke 21, verse 20, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, hello, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. That's exactly what he's talking about. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst depart out, and, not, and let not them that are in the countries enter here into. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. This is bang. This is the beginning. When Jerusalem is attacked at the end of 50 days, at the start of the red horse rider, at the start of the 14 years, bang. It begins with the destruction of Jerusalem. They will have a warning by the Son of Man for 40 days. Of course, what else will have happened? The escape will have happened. The Son of Man shows up. Signs and wonders. Warning them to be, that they're going to be surrounded and to flee. You see? There's going to be plenty of warning for them to get out. But they're going to be blinded. All right? Why are they blinded? Because it's not their time. Seals is to end the time of the Gentiles. It's to end the portion of the Gentile age before it goes back to Judah, to the Jews. That's why if you read Luke 21, 23, and we keep going, it says, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Well, isn't that what it just said in 19? Though, even the children that are within you? It says, for there shall be dis great distress in this land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, red horse rider, when the sword is given. And shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Listen to this. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Hello. See that? You don't get any of this story in, Mark discourse, in Mark's discourse or Matthew's discourse. This is pre-Jerusalem attack and, and the 14 years beginning, but it is in the portion of the 50 days that come first. There's already going to be chaos on the earth. There's, like I said, not only the escape happened, not only is there going to be an attack at about the same time in northern Israel, there's going to be a stone's throw. A meteor coming, destruction coming upon the earth, men's hearts failing them for looking at it. And then the Lord returns to begin his 40 days. And when he leaves, there'll be about three days left. He was warning them when you get compassed about. And then the raven spirit, the antichrist, the, the Mahdi spirit, the, 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 the Ishmael indwelling portion. 
will come upon that person and will surround Jerusalem. It'll come through Syria and those with Syria. I'm not saying Syria is the Antichrist. He is a possibility. But there are other candidates as well. But he's going to be 100%. It's going to be Arab. What a lot of people fail to understand is that this is between the Christians, right? It's Christians, Jewish, and Arabs. That's what it's all coming through, right? There, Buddha ain't, Buddha's not coming. There's no, there's no uh, uh, um, devil with Buddha. Like the, the devils and so forth that are with Buddha will probably support and empower with their devils and, 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 and uh, what is it, Shiva and all that other stuff. They're all their own devils leading astray, these people. But the story is against the Arabs, the Jews, and of course, the Christians. So, where do you think he's coming from? He is 100% going to be Arab. <laughs> you know, just as an example, uh, um, Prince Char uh, King Charles, what, what's his name now? Anyways, the new King Charles, they're not, do you, do you think Muslims all over the world are going to turn to King Charles? No, it's craziness. So why, why is it that there are so many Christians that believe it's a possibility? Because part of the reason is they only see the seven years. You see, when you only see the seven years, you, you can't really process these other portions and these other pieces. You see, if you don't have the, it, it makes everything more difficult if you don't understand who the Gospels are speaking to. You can't take it all the way back to the story of Genesis and show what the raven represents and the timing of the raven. You can't go to the story of Ishmael with Abraham and show that Ishmael represents this, this start of the 13th and then the 14th year, the promise comes. It's over and over and over again. You, you don't necessarily understand what it means when it says that Syria's coming surrounds them and destroys them even though Israel has the greater army. Jerusalem has to be destroyed. And that's what Luke 21's discourse is all about, a warning that it's coming first. And that this period of time will continue until that destruction, uh, um, that, that seven years and the destruction and then the rapture comes and their portion is over. All right, here's another one. In, with, like I said, I'm not going to go into a bunch of things within the discourses. But of course, we see this very famous one that we talk about here often. Uh, starting in Luke 21, verse 10. Then said he unto them. Okay, so only in Luke's discourse, out of all three discourses, Luke's discourse has two portions where he says, then said he unto them. So black letter words. And the other one you see is the parable of the fig tree. And he spake unto them a parable. Okay. When you see you shoot forth, you know that summer is near at hand. Well, interesting that uh, the third week of the end of the third week of June, summer is at hand, right? So it says what? You know that summer is now near at hand. What happens when it's over? Okay. It's all related to the end of 50 days with his wording. So what you're seeing here is he's saying this stuff here that I'm telling you about in Luke 21, verse 10 and 11, that's not your portion. That, that's not part of this discourse. That's what's going to happen to them, Mark and Matthew. Verse 12 is where he changes the wording and says, but before all these, of which he's talking about verse 10 and 11. So, but before all these. So before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, which begins at the sword, just like what, what did we read in Luke 19? What did we read in Luke 21 uh, in, in the, with um, being compassed about? When the sword is coming upon them. It begins at the red horse rider, nation against nation, when the great sword is given. But then he says what? In verse 12, he says, but before all these. Well, what do we know that's before the red horse rider when the sword is given? the white horse rider. They shall lay their hands on you, persecute you. So during this 40 days of the Son of Man being here, the white horse rider, there's going to be a persecution. There's going to be something 
called Some of You They Shall Cause to Be Put to Death. This is the Smyrna. This is the worker group with them. Not a hair of your head will perish. Here's the warning of the Son of Man because what? It's the Son of Man who's going to do as Jonah did. He's going to warn as Jonah did. Jonah warned for 40 days and he did it to Nineveh. The Son of Man is going to warn Jerusalem for 40 days. I'm sure he's going to warn more than just Jerusalem, but the focus is Jerusalem. And that's why you see it here. All of this conversation of the but before is all the stuff about the 40 days. When you come down, <clears throat> excuse me, to, to uh, Luke 21, 34 through 36, this is what happens before the 40 days. Okay, this is your pre-trib conversation. Whereas in Mark's, you read of that day and hour, no one knows. In Matthew, you read, as it was in the days of Noah, that day and hour, no one knows. And there's another difference as well, because only Matthew's is the one that says, as it was in the days of Noah. You don't get that in Mark. You only get nobody knows the day and hour. Well, now you can understand a little bit why nobody knows the day and hour. Because I just showed you they will have seen the kingdom of God come, but they don't know when they're going yet. Could you imagine the freak out that would be? <laughs> it's the it's six years of seals you've endured for those that survive it. You see the Lord coming in the clouds. And you're like, oh, yes, Lord, take me, take me. Oh, what? What, Lord? When are we going? When are we going, Lord, please? <laughs> you see, because they won't know right away when they're going. There's still time. You're going to see what that's all about as well, because there's that first sword. Remember, there's one sword and then there's another sword. So, and in Luke, you see it not only different than Mark and Matthew's, and not only different that only Matthew has the days of Noah, but you see nothing about knowing, not knowing the day and hour. See, it just says, don't be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life so that day come upon you unawares. So this is something like I was saying at the beginning of the video that can make people nervous about wanting to, to get things done in the world. But you gotta understand, going and getting things done on, in the world and things that need to get done, your faith shouldn't be so weak that that pulls you away. You see what I'm saying? It's not just about watching for when the Lord's coming. Oh, it's his day. You should be diligently in his word daily anyways. You see, you should be in prayer and repentant daily anyways. So that the things throughout your day that you're doing and throughout your life along the way, you're always giving him thanks anyways. You're spending time with him anyways. It shouldn't pull you away. And like I said, if you're a part of the ministry or if you want to join or whatever, you can always come and see us, right? You can always come and join the forum and so forth, which you can do from the website and it's 100% free. So, you see, it's completely different than the one from Mark and Matthew. And this one, in fact, it's so awesome. You can even see it in another apocryphal book. I've shared this one many times in 2nd Ezra chapter 13, starting verse 29. Behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth. This is the pre-trib escape. This is the Luke group right here. Verse 30 says, Then bewilderment of mind shall come on all those who dwell on the earth, and they shall plan to make war against each other, city against city, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's the red horse rider. You see? This is when the red horse rider, this is when the tribulation begins and it starts with the attack on Jerusalem. What happens before that? Bang. Delivering of those who are on the earth that were his, the pre-trib group. And before the red horse rider happens, so from, from the pre-trib escape to the war against each other, there's a period of bewilderment of mind where they plan to make war against each other. Awesome, right? Well, here's the other piece from Mark. Remember at the end of seals, or at the end of the sixth seal, the sixth year of seals, and they see the Lord coming on what? Well, he's not coming feet down on the Mount of Olives yet. Remember, he's in the clouds. It's Mark's portion. He's not coming on the clouds, so it's not like everybody's going to fully see. They're, they might be screaming, ah, <clears throat> you know. But it's not when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. And that's exactly what you get here 
in in second Esdras. You see, it says, then he's what? Then shall he be revealed. Uh, 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 an innumerable multitude will be gathered together, as you saw, desiring to come and conquer him. You see, this is that end of the first six years of seals, that first sword, that first battle that's going to take place. And look at where he's going to be. But he shall stand on top of Mount Zion. And Zion will come and be made manifest to all people prepared and built, as you saw, a mountain carved without hands. Well, now hold on a second. If he's coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, why would he be standing on Mount Zion and Mount Zion be manifest as, as a mountain carved without hands? Hello. Why? <laughs> because it's him coming with paradise. It's him coming on heavenly Mount Zion with a place prepared and built. This is your, excuse me, this is your mid-trib rapture mark group, your great multitude. When? After the first sword. This is why you go to Ezekiel, where are you? <clears throat> This is why, whoops, this is why when you go to Ezekiel, chapter 39, you see the Gog-Magog War, and it says that they'll burn weapons for seven years. Right? We've explained what that means. The seven years of burning weapons is the seventh year of seals, six years of trumpets before the Lord has his next battle. That's seven years. And that's why you have scripture that says, they're, they're, they're turning their weapons into pruning hooks and so forth. And then there's other scripture, I think in Isaiah, that talks about your pruning hooks and, and, and so forth being turned into spears. It's pretty crazy stuff. But it gets better than this. Because it goes on to say, And seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing them. Who is the house of Israel, brothers and sisters? The house of Israel is the great multitude rapture mark group. It's, it's the whole world and the Gentiles grafted in. Remember, the, the ten tribes, the house of Israel, scattered throughout the whole earth and the Gentiles mixed in and mingled. Nobody knows who they are anymore. They mingled together. So who is the house of Israel? It's the mid-trib great multitude rapture mark group. Look at what it says. It says they're going to be bearing the dead first. This is why after that battle, that Gog of Magog battle, at the end of the sixth year of seals, when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion, that's exactly what this battle is right here. This is why they will have seen him come. There'll be a battle that takes place of the Gog Magog war. Antichrist is killed. The rest have their dominion taken away, like Daniel tells us. And... The Lord will then seal the 144. The great multitude rapture will come in. But we know they don't go right away. They're, they're, there's going to be a cleanup. It, it's right there. We can show in the revelation of the 14 years and, the, and who the Gospels are speaking to, every single piece and point that has been mysterious to understand within Ezekiel chapter 39. We can explain the seven years of burning weapons where the world will tell you that the Ezekiel 39 war is coming first. Uh, then how do you have seven years of burning weapons during World War III? Doesn't make any sense. Some others will tell you, well, it's the seven years of burning weapons after the tribulation. Why would, they be, why would there be a need to burn weapons for seven years of the 1,000 millennial reign? You see, some will tell you, oh, they need it for fuel. <laughs> no, <clears throat> that's that. It, it doesn't even make sense. It's the revelation of 14 years that proves it to you. And then we can prove this out. And what is the answer to this? It's what we were just showing you over in the transfiguration story of Mark. They will have seen the Lord coming, but they won't know when it is. That's how incredible it is. It just keeps going and going and going. 
Let me see where I was going to continue with this. Da -da 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 -da, Luke 21. Yes. So, so these are those differences, right? That's what, so that's going back to this, what I was showing you here in 2nd Esdras. So anybody that had read this in the past and going through 2nd Esdras and seeing him coming on Mount Zion with a place prepared and built, you've got to think there had to have been confusion. There must have been confusion. Because everybody will tell you that when tribulation is over, sure, he takes the people pre-trib if they believe in pre-trib, but then there's nothing till he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Well, then what do you say about this? When he's going to be there, Mount Zion will be, will be made manifest. So it's not just the, the, the mountain that's there, the hill that's there in Israel right now. This is Zion that will become to be made manifest, prepared, and built for them. And yet, there was a sword before it. There was a war before it. And when he comes, it's going to be prepared and built. Well, where is this, where is this group going? Of course, they're going to paradise. What does it say about this group? L listen to what it says about where this group was a part of. In verse 39, it says, and as for you seeing him gather to himself another multitude that was peaceable, these are the 10 tribes, okay? Because it's the what? House of Israel. Okay, so it's called the 10 tribes here, but we know the Gentiles are grafted in. It, it, it's, it's so awesome. Do, do you see why in Luke 21, he told them until what? Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled is the end of seals. You see? The, the Gentiles are connected to what? Well, they're grafted in with the house of Israel. So where is the end of the time of the house of Israel, the ten tribes? When he gathers them into Zion, the being made manifest, prepared, and built. And listen to where they were, which were led away from their own land into captivity in the days of King Hosea, whom Shulamanser, the king of the Assyrians, led captive. There's the Assyrians again and Shulamanser. This typology of the Arab is 100% going to play again. So there's, there's a few things in here, but we have broken this down so many times over the years. It, it, I could do this whole thing in my sleep. This whole part is just, it, it's all there. So what do we see? Mount Zion. What do we see? A place prepared and built. And we see um, uh, the rapture of the great multitude coming in as being the house of Israel. Okay? So we see that, that sword as well. Okay? So now let's continue let me go to the main part here and let me show you this part that i'm telling you about with the two swords let's go to luke chapter 22. in luke chapter 22 it, it I've, I've said it many times i just love the story that takes place here first of all in luke 22 verse 40, 41 you have Jesus talking that he's about a stone's throw away when they went up the mountain to pray, right? Well, it's a strange piece of conversation because it only happens in Luke. And when you understand the connection to the Gospel of John, you'll see the fact of where it's mentioned is also very interesting. Let me show you what I mean on two of these accounts. One about this and one that, that connects to what we were talking about in 2nd Esdras and the time of the rapture of the great multitude. So in the stones cast, you only see it in Luke, and it's talking, it's a typology of right near the beginning as it's all about to start. Well, you're gonna notice, and this isn't the purpose of today's video, but you're gonna notice that there's 21 chapters in John. Well, what else is interesting is that John's gospel isn't part of the synoptic gospels. I didn't make that up. I don't even know what it fully means. But it's, I, I love the fact that the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to with Matthew, Mark, and Luke has John separate. And the revelation of John is that his chapters play out for us with events in years of a story that we call Revelation of the Chapters to Years. All of these books, Hosea, Zechariah, John, Acts, Zach, uh, Ezekiel, 
Psalms, Genesis, Hebrews, Exodus, and Judges. All of their chapters have events within them that are year events within the end of days. It sounds crazy. People will tell you, oh, the chapters and the verses, they're all man-made. What, you don't think it could be spirit-guided like the ones who wrote the books? This is the evidence that it is 100% true that these guys were also spirit-led. So let me give you an example of what it is I'm talking about. First of all, you've got the stone's throw. Well, what did we talk about with the stone's throws coming? It's right around the time of, of the escape of the bride of Christ and the 50 days have started, right? That above 14 year portion. And there's a stone's throw coming in, in that time frame. Men's hearts failing them for fear, you see? Well, that's right around what? Six to the eighth, uh, seven to the eighth chapter, right? So you go to John, what happens when we go to John chapter eight? You see the same story. That's almost sounds like it's a continuation in John eight, verse one and two. That sounds like a continuation from the end of Luke's discourse. That's one interesting thing. The next thing you see is the woman taken in adultery, right? Adultery is just, it, it's a Gentile term as well, okay? What do they want to do? They want to throw stones at her. Jesus says, who among you is without sin? Let him cast the first stone. Let him first cast a stone at her. The only one without sin here is Christ. So who's the one who's going to cast the stone? Jesus. When do we know this stone is going to be cast? Somewhere near the beginning of the 50 days, near the beginning at the escape, right at that time. He's the only one that can cast the stone. Man starts failing them and bang, look up, your redemption is at hand. You see? And then what happens? It's only him standing before the woman. Sounds like a bridal proposal, right? Like a whole wedding story. And then he talks about being the light of the world in the beginning of his 40 days. That's one thing. But what I really wanted to show you was one that's much simpler in what we're talking about here with this place prepared and built. First of all, let's go back into Luke chapter 22. And you're going to see this story again only found in Luke's gospel. And I always get a kick out of it. Okay, here's the stone's throw. But now listen to this story <laughs> in Luke chapter 22. Uh, we won't read. It's from 35 through 38. But let's, well, let's start in verse 36. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script. <coughs> and he that hath no sword, <coughs> excuse me, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Okay? So sell whatever you have. Guys, all you guys that are standing here with me, Whoever doesn't have a sword, go sell what you can and get a sword. For I say unto you that this, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. Verse 38, here it is. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. <laughs> I, I sincerely laugh every time I read this. I chuckle because he told all of them. Everybody who's there who doesn't have a sword, go sell what you have and get a sword. And he tells them this and these things that have reckoned among the transgressors and the things of him have an end. And they literally turn around. You, you got to picture it, right? They're like having a conversation. Jesus has another few things to say. And they're like, hey, you got a sword? No, you got a sword? No, I don't got one. Man, what do I have to sell? Who's going to give me enough money to sell a sword? Well, our clothes are valuable. So, man, I'm not going to walk around naked, though. Dude, you got a sword? I got one. Hey, dude, I got one. I got one. Here, take this one. Hey, Lord, look, we've got two. And then he says, yeah, okay, that's good. <laughs> it just seems like the funniest thing in my mind when I picture it. It's, it's, it's strange. But the revelation of it is awesome. It's absolutely awesome. I don't know if you're newer to this ministry and you've never heard this revelation before. 
of what this meaning is? Well, you've already started to hear it. Now I'll finish the story of it for you. Because there's no way on earth you've ever received the understanding of what this means unless you've been a part of this ministry or learned from somebody who's a part of this ministry. These two swords are the ones that belong to the Lord. What are these two swords about? <coughs> Excuse me. Remember this? They're desiring to come and to conquer him and he's going to defeat them. Well, when he comes and defeats them here in this Ezekiel 39 battle that takes place, this is that first sword. This is the one of those two swords. This is precisely that time. This is when Antichrist is killed. And everybody who came to war and battle, they get killed. But the rest of the leadership, the other, the, the 10 and the false prophet, they're still alive. They get their dominions taken away. This is Daniel chapter 7. But what does it say now after this war, after this sword? It says what? He's going to be there on heavenly Mount Zion and the place is going to be, is going to be made manifest, prepared and built. Let me show you how awesome this is. Prepared and built. Well, <clears throat> let's go to the the uh oops 22 let's go to the story of the passover meal okay the passover meal remember what i said the the story of the of the resurrection in that time frame the story of the transfiguration the story of the triumphal entries have all typologies in them of pre mid and post it's coming for 40 days so you know a week after the pre but it's coming for 40 days is coming at the end of six years of seals and is coming at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. So here we are in Luke <clears throat> and it's the typology of him coming at the, at the start of his 40 days before the 14 years start. And we see it's a story of him going to find a place to prepare, right? And he says, starting in 22 verse 10, behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bring a pitcher, follow him wherever he enters. Verse 21, uh, sorry, verse 11. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, the master saith unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Okay, that's all the story that you get. Verse 12, here's another beautiful piece. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished there make ready okay a large upper room furnished there make ready well look at this word for upper room above ground right an upper room above ground high up upward the typology is heaven the typology is the kingdom of god i'm going to prove it to you because remember i'm still talking about what we were talking about with the with the first sword and after that battle with the first sword right that ezekiel 39 battle then what's going to happen well the great multitude rapture is going to eventually happen in that year right so when the great multitude rapture happens what did it say in second esdras that mount zion having been a place now right made manifest prepared and built well watch what happens in mark you go to mark's story mark chapter 14 and we read the story uh, starting in 1414 of Mark. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house, the master saith, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Verse 15, and he shall show you a large upper room. Look at that. <clears throat> the words only used twice a large upper room furnished and prepared there make ready furnished and prepared there make ready you only get this in luke and in mark <clears throat> where you're going to find that this upper room is mentioned well, remember how I started this going into 2 Corinthians 
we see that there's a taking and a taking and a return. So you have Luke and Mark that go to an upper room. <clears throat> Luke's was not told. He was told it was furnished, but not a place that's been prepared. Why? Because Luke, Luke's group, the pre-trib, the bride of Christ, they are not going to paradise. They're going to the third heaven. Mark's group is going to paradise, which is heavenly Mount Zion being revealed to them. And it is a place prepared. When you go to Matthew, look at Matthews. Matthew 26. Look, it, you don't even have any of that story. Matthew 26, uh, starting verse 18. And he said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, listen to this. My time is at hand. Very different, isn't it? My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Totally different story. What does that mean, his time is at hand? It's the end. It's when he's returning. It's when he's going to be made manifest to everyone. When he's coming on the clouds. When he's going to be as lightning from one end unto the other. It's played out over and over and over again. Look at how accentuated it is in Mark chapter 14, verse 14. Look at that. 1414 is where this story starts. And then 1415, listen to what it says, and I will show thee a large upper room, furnished and prepared. Well, what period of time is that in tribulation? It's the seventh year of seals, right? This is when he comes at the end of the sixth year, right? Right at the end, which is the start of the seventh year of seals. Okay, so he's destroyed them at the end of the sixth. There was that battle, which is the Ezekiel 39. There's seven months of bearing bones during the seventh year of seals. What is the seventh year of seals when he's come on heavenly Mount Zion, which has been made manifest? Look at that. It's John chapter 14. So John chapter 14, do you think there's a clue for us in this? Look at how fantastic this is. In John chapter 14, what does he tell them? Starting in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe God in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare. Hello. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Sound familiar? Seventh year of seals in the big picture is the 14th year. And what is John 21 chapters? The 14th chapter at the seventh year of seals. There he is on heavenly Mount Zion with the place prepared, which is directly related to when he comes on Mount Zion, destroys them in the Ezekiel 39 war. They're burying weapons. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're burying the dead. They've changed the weapons for seven years. And what do you got? When Zion, which is paradise, will be made manifest, prepared, and built. Amazing, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. Well, it still gets better. Because remember, Luke said that there were two swords. So if there's two swords, we got to find the evidence of, okay, if that's really one sword, how can we know that's one sword and where do we find the second one? Well, for that, we go to Zechariah chapter 14. Pretty amazing, right? 21 chapters in John, 14 chapters in Zechariah. And my point isn't to go into these chapters to years, but here's Zechariah 14 chapters, which relates to the 14th year after six years, that seventh year of trumpets, right? The after six days, the after six years is the time of the start of the seventh year of trumpets. So what are we seeing? Well, we shouldn't see them on heavenly Mount Zion anymore, right? We shouldn't see them on the mountain of the Lord, Mount Zion. We should see them coming and standing feet down on the Mount of Olives. 
So what do we get? Zechariah 14, uh, starting in verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against thee, Jerusalem, to battle. All nations against Jerusalem to battle. So you've got a battle here taking place. It's the word 4412. But let's keep going. Let's go to verse 3 and verse 4. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. Listen to this. As when. Past tense. As when he fought in the day of battle. So you got another one here that means in the day of battle. So you got a battle, which means this one as a hostile encounter, battle, war. And it's the Hebrew word 7128. Yet in verse 2, you said, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. This one is the big one. The big battling warfare, right? This is the final one. So what do you have here? You have as when he fought. That was one sword. And you have this one that is about to take place here, which is the second sword. So what is he doing? Or what did he do in Zechariah 14.3? This is the Ezekiel 39 war. This is when he destroyed the Antichrist and the enemies and all those gathered against. And Mount Zion, uh, uh, heavenly Mount Zion came to be manifest, prepared and built in the rapture of the great multitude group go. But this has nothing to do with heavenly Mount Zion here, because if you go to verse four, it says, and his feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst where, therefore, thereof toward the east and toward the west and so forth. This is when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives that everybody talks about. Nobody can explain to you prophetically, because you see, if this is him coming down, feet down on the Mount of Olives, which it is, and everybody refers to it, and it's at the end of tribulation, then if this is all part of the tribulation, because this is saying, then will he come, then who has ever been able to explain what it means as when he fought in the day of battle? When will he have fought in that day of battle? The answer is the end of the sixth year of seals. So much so that we saw that it said, then heavenly Mount Zion would become to be made manifest. Well, watch this. If we look, as we understand, and we have proven that Zechariah has typologies within the 14 years, then that means at the end of the sixth, the Lord is, is, is destroying the enemies, right? He's going to be seen at the start of the seventh year, Heavenly Mount Zion has come to be made manifest. Which means when trumpets start in chapter 18, uh, uh, sorry, in chapter 8, which would equal what? Which would be the eighth year of tribulation or the first year of trumpets, then the Lord should be on Heavenly Mount Zion. Right? We saw him at the end of the sixth seal. We know that there's going to be a battle that he destroys them. Then it's going to be the place prepared. So they're going to be taken to paradise, the place prepared and built for them. But we know it's not when he's on, when he's feet down on the Mount of Olives. We know that there was another battle before. So what's the answer? It's right here. Here's the other piece of the evidence. Here's the beginning of trumpets in the, in the time frame. And Zechariah chapter 8, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I was jealous for her with a great fury. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. And listen to this. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Pretty crazy, right? And then what happens? We've talked about this so many times. I don't want to get into all this. That's not today's video. You come down to Zechariah 8, 10, and it says, for before these days, so there's a period of time before this event happens here where I'm there on Mount Zion, right? The heavenly Mount Zion being uh, uh, made manifest, prepared and built. He says, before this time, there was no man for hire, nor beast, nor was there any peace to them that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set every man against his neighbor. You see that? For I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. 
Well, what is setting all men, everyone against their neighbor? It's Mark, right? It's Mark chapter 13, verse 8. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. What does 2nd Ezra tell us? It's after the pre-trib escape. There's going to be bewilderment of mind to those who are left on the earth. This is all what Luke 21, 34 through 36 is saying. And they're going to plan to make what? War against each other, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. All the stuff that I told you before will happen. Then will my son be made manifest. So awesome. Don't let anybody, once you understand the revelation of the Gospels in the 14 years, don't let anybody try to twist you out of it. It should be impossible because once you see it, you can never unsee it. It's, it's so fantastic. It's, it's over the top fantastic. It's so good. I even pinch myself still all the time to say, I cannot believe this is happening. It's that, it, it's that incredible. Okay, so let's see the next pieces here. Uh, furnish and prepare, there, make ready. Okay, we've covered those. Let's go see what next I have, Matthew. Okay, what do we got in Matthew 26? Oh, yeah, my time is at hand. Okay, let's now go. I got Matthew 24. Okay, yeah. Let's lead this to go into a couple portions here. Now, remember, Matthew 24, I'll, I'll go through this portion quickly before going back to the beginning of it. Um, let's go, because again, this is something we recently covered as well. When you see the, the, the quote unquote commission that you see at the end of Luke, the end of Mark. So in Luke 24, Mark 16, and Matthew 28, the commissions are completely different, right? And we've shared on many of these things in the past. You have something like I shared in the intro video um, in Luke 24, 51. At the end of it, it says when Jesus was carried up into heaven. When you go to the end of Mark, so it's another one of those simple ones that we've talked on, right? You go to the end of Mark and it says Jesus was received up. It, it, if it was the same event, it would be the same wording. But it's not even the same wording. Like, e even if the wording was different, it should have the same definition for word. How about that? But it doesn't have that either. What does it have? Christ being, it has Christ being what? Being carried up, so he's being taken up. You have Christ being received up, so he's being received up somewhere. Both of them are ups. And look at what it says in Matthew 28. In Matthew 28, he says, teaching them, uh, actually a little bit further up, in verse 18, halfway through, well, in, starting in verse 18, Matthew 28, starting in verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Well, isn't that fascinating? Isn't that exactly what we were talking about at the end of the, se se at the, at the seventh year of trumpets, right? The 14th year of tribulation? When he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, all power in heaven and on earth are given to him. We talked about this before. There's no more preaching. It's only teaching the ways of the Lord because everybody will have seen him return as what? Well, let's go further back in Matthew uh, 28. And you see what? Well, you see that there's a great earthquake. Verse 3 says, his countenance was like lightning. Do you know it's the only gospel that talks about Jesus in, in, the, in the typologies uh, um, at the last chapter or in the discourses where Jesus is referred to as the lightning. It's always only found in Matthew. And the one place it's found in Luke chapter 17 is a direct reference to when the Lord comes as lightning from one end to the other on his day, which is what? The day of the Lord. It's when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. So, when we come down here and we then read the rest of Matthew 28 at the end, where they're now only teaching, listen to what it says in verse 20. Teaching them to observe all, all things whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always until the end of the world. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> you see, what, what does the church teach? 
The church reads from this, and they read it with the eyes and the understanding of the is. You know, because Christ dwells within us. And that's perfectly fine. However, it's not the real revelation of it. They only believe that that's what the understanding is because everything they've learned is from Matthew. If they had spent all of their time reading from Mark and went to Matthew for a little bit and Luke for a little bit, then they wouldn't have thought this was related to now. And the same if they went to Luke. You see? But this is what I was telling you earlier. The Lord knew it and had it purposed from the beginning. Because of his harvest model, 10%, the great multitude, corners and gleaning. If the church was fully aware, if the church had really known and understood that they shouldn't have been learning from Matthew and that they should go Luke, Mark, Matthew to be able to be aware and prepare for the is to come and to always have people ready and watching and to be able to dig deeper into the word, then who would have wanted to be a Mark group? Nobody. Nobody who loves the Lord and is going to church and seeking their Bibles, you know, if they really knew that the truth was Luke is the pre-trib and they could have been learning from Luke more so all the way, why would they have bothered with Mark or Matthew? But the Lord, obviously knowing all things right from the beginning, knew it, and the evidence of it is his harvest model. Pre-mid post is 10% the great multitude, and then corners and gleaning. That's the literal harvest model. So had the, had the church realized it, the world and the church and the house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in, had it already been understood, they would have been ready and it wouldn't be 90% of the church remaining. Pretty crazy to think about, right? So there's your end of the world. What a difference it makes, doesn't it? Well, let's go back now to Luke's. Luke 24. So in that, we saw that Jesus was taken, carried up. We saw that he was received up. But in Matthew, in Matthew, he was now here. All things were his. And he's now here till the end of the world. So what do you have? A taking up, a taking up, in a sense, right? A, 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 a carry up, a received up. And... Now he's here. What was the typology in the storyline with Paul in 2 Corinthians 12? A taken to the third heaven, a taken to paradise, and returning and coming to them. Over and over and over. It's the kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. It's absolutely beautiful. <coughs> and then, of course, even with the conversation that he has with them, we, without going into too much detail, we know that the group that he talks with here is the disciples Smyrna group and so forth. In Mark, it relates to the 144,000 that are getting sealed in the seventh year of seals before the rapture. And at the end of Matthew, you would say, well, he's now here till the end of the world. Why is there a worker group when the Lord is here? Because they're the ones relating to the 12 tribes that go out during the millennial reign to teach the ways of the Lord. Those are the three different worker groups. But John is also involved. John's gospel uh, relates to the apostles at the beginning as well. So there'll be apostles. There'll be those with the 40 days of the Son of Man. Both of those groups will work during seals. Maybe longer, but at least seals. Mark has a group of 144 from it. They're going to work during trumpets. And the end of Matthew, they're going to work during, um, during uh, the millennial reign. And you could see that from Revelation chapter 20. The ones that are part of the resurrection, remember we showed that? Those who put their necks on the line, that's the Smyrna group, that's the disciples Luke group. They're going to put their necks on the line. They're going to be the ones that are going to be part of the first resurrection. You see, they only get part in, they're, they're the only ones, right? With some of the, the ancient ones that were promised their, their promised land, right? Their promised millennial reign. But for anybody else, that's the only group getting resurrected. The rest of the dead aren't raised until the third day. And we, this is what we see. Let me go to it real quick. This is what you see in Hosea, chapter 6, right? Starting in verse 1. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days he will receive us. 
That's after the 2,000 years. In the third day, okay, 3,000 years, he will raise us up and we shall live and we shall live in his sight. Okay, but not until the 3,000 years. It's only those who put their necks on the line during the time of seals who get to be resurrected to rule and reign with them. All right? Um, so now you see this within this conversation. We've got videos on this as well, so I'm, I'm not really going to go into it except that you say, except that you see the differences of the conversations going on here. He doesn't, he doesn't berate them. He's not upset with them. He tells them what they're going to do. You go read about what they're going to do in Mark, and he berates on them first. They weren't really, they didn't believe the testimony of the witnesses, which are the seals workers. They, they didn't believe it. He rails on them. All right. He doesn't sit down to eat with them. He only sits down to eat and serve these guys. That's from Luke chapter 12. This, this group right here is the first watch. The end of Mark is the second watch. The end of Matthew is the third watch. This was the only group ready and watching, and they're going to be part of the resurrection of the dead if, for those that die along the way uh, doing this. So again, let's now go into the beginning of the resurrection here in Luke. And this is within this storyline, like I told you, Within this storyline of the Synoptic Gospels, people will have read this, but they never knew that there was there was any difference, right? There was never really any serious understanding that that it was a differences within the Gospels. You know, it's not like reading about an eight days and after six after six. I mean, that's a clear quote unquote discrepancy. This isn't. This just seems like another portion of the story, okay? Just like another thing happening at that time. But when you see its revelation. It brings you insight because when you understand it, it means that you've grasped the rest of it, that your eyes can see and you're understanding even deeper. Because there's only one way to understand this, and that is if you have first already begun to understand this revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to over their portions of time. Okay? Listen to this. This is a great little piece right here. Remember, in the synoptic Gospels is the conversation here. And what do we know? Luke is first, right? Pre-trib. Uh, Mark is second. Mid-trib, great multitude, rapture, seventh year of seals. And Matthew is post-trib, returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. A taking, a taking, a returning. So what do we get in Luke 24? Listen to verse 3. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Sounds pretty harmless, right? Pretty innocent wording. Verse four, and it came to pass, they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. So what happened? The body of the Lord Jesus was taken and they were perplexed. Do you know, this is something you guys will have heard a long time ago. Do you know, if you go do a word search and search the word perplexed, it's synonymous with bewilderment. Okay, perplexed and bewildered, it's the same wording. And what happened? The body of the Lord Jesus. Well, who's the body of Jesus? His bride. <clears throat> his bride is his body. And what do you get? The Most High delivered those who were on the earth. That's the pre-trib bride of Christ. His bride is his body. And what happens? They were perplexed. Bewilderment of mind came on those who were looking for them. And what happened? The body of the Lord Jesus wasn't there and the world was perplexed. You think, oh, well, maybe that's a little reaching. You might think so, but that would mean you probably haven't been paying attention to the last two hours and 14 minutes. You see? Let me show you how convincing this is. Let's go into Mark. Let's go to Mark's resurrection story. In Mark chapter 16, very early in the morning, first day of the week. Okay, right here, starting Mark 16, verse 1. This one's awesome. This one, at first, you're just like, oh, yeah, why would they use her name? What's the purpose of her name? Why didn't they just use Mary again? Right? You see, they got Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and 
Salome. Salome is only used twice in scripture. At the end of verse 15 of, uh, of chapter 15 of, of Mark, and then again in verse 1 of Mark 16, 1. Why? You see, it, it, there's a reason. Every single thing in scripture has a reason. We don't know what all of those reasons are, not even close. But in this revelation of the end, we have so many little clips and parts and pieces that are just phenomenal. They blow our minds. Listen to this. And it's not just about saying, say, here it is. I'm going to show you the revelation of it. So there was no Salome in, in Luke. But in Luke, the body of the Lord Jesus was gone. Do you see that in Mark? Nope. No body was gone. <clears throat> what happens if we go to Matthew? The end of the Sabbath day began to begin. And came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And the, there was a great earthquake. See? There's that great earthquake. Where was the other great earthquake? You also see it in, uh, in uh, 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 the discourse. Angel of the Lord rolled back, countenance like lightning. No, no body. No body. Interesting, right? So only Luke's has the body that was gone. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ was gone. That's because in the synoptic gospel revelation, that is the bride of Christ gone and them being perplexed, them being in bewilderment. In fact, we can prove that out <clears throat> directly in Luke's discourse so that you can know it's related to the end of days. Watch this. Luke 21, verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with the suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. Verse 35. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. You see? It's going to be a snare. What does that mean? It, it, does somebody who step into a snare, are they aware that it was there? No. They are caught unawares. They are caught off guard. They got caught in the snare, not aware. They were what? Perplexed. They're bewildered. Oh, what on earth? <clears throat> I was just having dinner in front of my family and they, they vanished. Am I in a dream? Is this reality? What happened? This is exactly what that's saying. <clears throat> it's exactly what this is saying. So what do you think I'm going to be able to find when we go to Mark and we get this strange little occurrence with this woman named Salome? <clears throat> Remember, it's types and shadows and everything in Scripture has its purpose. Well, Salome, this Salome was a good woman. She was a Christian God-fearing, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. She was Christian. She was God-fearing, right? Love the Lord. She wasn't a bad Salome. But her reference of her name and the typology is directly connected to the bad Salome. You say, bad Salome, what on earth are you talking about? <clears throat> the bad Salome is this one right here. Remember that? Salome who requested the head of John the Baptist through her mother, right? And it was for Herod, remember? Herod said, oh, yes, what would you like, Salome? What would you like for your birthday? And she talks to her mother, hey, what should I get? What should I get? And the mother, of course, hated John the Baptist, who was in prison, and she requested her head, or John's head, right? And, of course, her name was Salome. Salome was responsible for what? Beheading. Huh. When do the beheadings take place during tribulation? They take place during seals. And the connection is in relation to John the Baptist. <clears throat> so, what does the end of Mark's gospel represent? What did I say and what I've been saying throughout the typology of the resurrection story of Mark represent the end of the six years of seals. The Lord coming 
at the time of the, that rapture time frame. When what? The name representing beheadings is there. Why do you think it is? Her relation is to the beheading of John the Baptist. Check this out. If we go, I told you we were going to come back here again. If we go to the other story, which is the transfiguration, for which is also another typology in Luke, Mark, and Matthew of the 40 days, right? Son of man coming, the end of seals, right? The sixth year of seals, the seventh, seventh year, sorry, the seventh year of seals and the seventh year of trumpets. Well, then we know Luke's was the beginning of the 40 days, right? <clears throat> Check this out. Let's read a little further down. Uh, Luke 9, 34. It says, while he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. This is pretty awesome, actually. I'm just getting a little, a little nudge as I'm reading it. I'll, I'll, I'll look into it more and save it for something else. But it, remember, this is directly related to the time frame of the start of the 40 days and who goes up into the cloud uh, at the end of seven days and goes in for 40 days, but Moses, right? And we also know the typology of Moses is the relation to seals. Anyways, that's a side note. So um, go into a cloud, verse 35. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone and they were kept and they kept it close and told no man in those days of any of those things which they had seen. Okay? Now you're saying, uh, okay, what does this have to do with John? What does this have to do with Salome? Right? Where's where's the John typology? There is none. <laughs> there is none. Because in Luke's, there shouldn't be. Do you know why there shouldn't be? Let me prove it out to you. Uh, brrr, where am I going? Da, 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 Luke 12. Listen to Luke 12. In Luke 12, we come to this part. I mean, we've talked about it so many times as well. Starting in Luke 12, verse 35, you know, be girded about. So the Lord is pre-telling. I absolutely believe in my heart and in my understanding that this first watch group is the Lord here pre-telling them right before the body of the Lord being taken, right before the pre-trib escape of the bride of Christ. Remember, the workers, they are expecting, they're hopeful, they're, they're watching and praying always to be accounted worthy. Not everybody knows if they're workers or not. Not everybody knows if they're going to serve the Lord during seals and be with them for 40 days or not. So what is he going to do? He's going to let them know Right before, a short period of time, I don't know how long before, but shortly before the escape of the pre-trib bride of Christ happens, he is going to inform whoever those people are to be girded about, to let them be prepared, so that when he returns from the wedding and knocks, they may open unto him immediately. This is that group he's going to serve and sit down and eat with, and he only does that in Luke's, with, uh, <coughs> with Luke's resurrection story. All right. It's only the disciples that he did that with. Then you see the second watch and the third watch. Okay. This is the 144 at the end of seals. This, the third watch is the 12 tribe portion that go out during the millennial reign. That's the third watch. Now, listen to what he says. Okay. He's talking coming or going uh, of that day and of that hour. You know, they wouldn't know if their servant's not paying attention, right? Well, let's keep going a little bit further. <clears throat> Luke 12, verse 49. Remember, all through end time eyes. He says, I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already king, it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and now I am straightened till it be accomplished. Verse 51 through 53. Suppose ye that I am come to bring peace on the earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth forth, there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father 
the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. You see that? What's he coming to do? He's coming to bring division. Well, let's go to Luke's discourse. And again, this story you only hear in Luke. This is about him when he comes for his 40 days. And what do you see with Luke? 21 verse 16. And they shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends. And some of you they shall cause to be put to death. So this is related to the period while the Son of Man is here, saying, I'm about to bring division and, and, and d division in the, in the world and in households and everything. It's time to stand for me, right? It's time to what, uh, you know, go or get off the pot, right? It's time to take action. Look what happens when you go to Mark. When you go to Mark's discourse, and we're still talking about John. You'll see where I'm going with this. We go to Mark's discourse, and what does he say? Uh, in Mark 13, verse 10, 11, let's go to verse 12. Now, the brother shall betray the brother to death, the father, the son, and the children shall raise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. When is this happening? This is happening during the first half minimum, but during seals. It's in Mark's discourse. Brother betraying father and son and, and mother and daughter and everything. <laughs> it starts in Luke's during the 40, 50 days. It continues during Mark's. But look what happens when you get to Matthew. Look what you read in Matthew. It's not there. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. But you see, it's not father and son, mother against daughter. These are nations, the people of the world, because this is the time building to when Satan's about to be released. And uh, uh, these are his people there now, right? And so they're going to be hated by many. But what did you see? You see that the division started at the start of the 40 days and it goes during seals. But what happens at the end of seals? The Lord has come at heavenly Mount Zion. The place prepared and built. The rapture of the great multitude goes. They're going to start rebuilding. He ends up making a covenant with all nations. We read that from Zechariah 11, which is why he has to break the covenant in Zechariah 11. <clears throat> it's the one that he made at the beginning of trumpets. Everybody thinks it's the Antichrist. This is what I was talking about earlier. Why do they think it's the Antichrist that's going to build the temple and then step into it and declare himself God? Because they only see seven years. Antichrist is going to be brought back, but the first half of trumpets... It's the Son of Man himself there. Having come on heavenly Mount Zion, they're going to be rebuilding, see? Until what? Until he's cut off. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So what do we see? Only in the 40, 50-day portion of Luke's is, is this division starting. And then throughout seals, the division is there within the household. But it stops at the end of seals. There is no division against father and son, mother and daughter, during trumpets it's just nations of people hating them because they're now having their portion so when we go back into luke chapter 9 and remember we're still talking about john we're still talking about salome the typology of the beheading when we come back into luke's uh luke 9 there was no conversation of of the elijah there was no conversation of john the john uh, um uh, John the Baptist being the Elijah type, right? Look what happens when we get to Mark and his transfiguration story. Remember, this is, as, this is the typology at the end of six years of seals, at the seventh year of seals. And look at what we read. Let's get to... Let's start... Yeah, let's go to... Let's start in verse 9. Mark 9, verse 9. And as they had come down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one another what the rising from the dead should mean. Verse 11. And they asked him, saying, 
why say the scribes that Elijah, that Elijah must come first? All right, must first come. Verse 12, and he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restores all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it was written of him. Now, isn't that interesting? Division starts in the household during the 40 days of the Son of Man because he said he was coming to bring division. Division breaks out in the households at the beginning of, of tribulation. But who, who ends up beheading John the Baptist? Solomon does. So in the typology of the resurrection story, and you get to Mark, which is the typology of him coming after the first six years of seals, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, and you got the transfiguration that's also a typology of it. And here he is coming at the end of six years of seals. And when he comes, they're saying, hey, where's Elijah? He's saying Elijah already came. See, Very, verily Elijah cometh first and restores all things. <coughs> and then he says, indeed, he already came. Do you follow what that's saying? If Christ came and starts the 40 days by bringing division in the families, within households, because it's now time to make the decision because you don't have much time left. The tribulation has now begun. And you go to Mark's discourse and it's the division within the houses, within father and son and mother and daughter and everything else. And so what does it mean by the time you get to the end of the sixth year of seals? That John, the, the, whoever the John the Baptist, Elijah type, he has shown up. He restored all things and he put his neck on the line. What happened to John the Baptist? Beheaded. Who caused his beheading? Salome. Who is John a reference in a typology of? Those who put their necks on the line during the time of seals. They will be the ones helping to restore all things. You see, who do they compare John the Baptist to? Elijah. So you have two types. You have John the Baptist who put his neck on the line for the churches in that typology, right? John the Baptist put his neck on the line, was killed by Salome, which during the time of seals will be over by the time the Lord returns on heavenly Mount Zion. And they're saying, hey, where was he? And he's saying he was already here. He restored all things. And then you've got Elijah. And the Elijah type, he never died. Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind. What two types do we have at the end of seals? Those who put their necks on the line and those who are alive at the end of seals. What did it say in Mark? What did it say back in Mark chapter one? That there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. They saw the kingdom of God come with power and those that were alive and remain to that point, they're going what? In the mid-trib great multitude rapture to paradise. Who are those in the typology of the John the Baptist type having put their necks on the line? You got it. Those workers, the John the Baptist types, those going out to work during seals putting their necks on the line. It's fantastic because you don't see it in Luke. You only see it in Matthew at the end of the six years of seals, directly related in the typology where everything else is connected. You see that Jesus at the beginning of tribulation says he's bringing division. And when John comes, he is going to be the one to restore the division that Christ brought. Why did Christ bring the division? To force everybody to wake up. Now was the time. What is it that he's bringing to cause this division? Tribulation. 
but he's not leaving everybody hanging. He's going to leave workers a remnant portion to wake them up, to do miracles, signs, and wonders, to do all sorts of things during seals. And many of them will have had their necks put on the line. Having restored all things. Because the age of the Gentiles comes to an end. Father and mother, son and daughter will be restored. Pretty awesome, right? Do you think it's a mystery anymore? Or do you you see why it was such a mystery? That in Mark's gospel, in the typology within that resurrection story, in the typology being when he comes at the end of six years of seals, that suddenly there's Salome there? I'm sure people have questioned it in the past, but you couldn't have understand it without the revelation of the Gospels. Let's see what Matthew says. <clears throat> Matthew, <laughs> starting in verse, uh, in Matthew 17, starting in verse 9. Again, from the transfiguration story. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Wait a second. Why did it add from the dead? Right? Mark was just till the Son of Man be risen. All of a sudden here, we've got risen again from the dead. <clears throat> I'm always reminded, uh, one of our brothers I talk to regularly, Mark Scuderi, and he told me when he was a little kid, and he had asked his father what it meant. Why would it say again? Right? Doesn't that mean doing something over again? And that gets to be a very hard pill to swallow, right? What do you mean again? Well, let's just keep reading. Then in verse 10, it says, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise, (coughs) shall the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Meaning they realized, this is the end of trumpets, right? The end of the six years of trumpets. And they're like, whoa, 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 what about this John the Baptist with this typology, this Elijah type? And he's like, yeah, he, he, he already came. It's not like recently already came and died now. This is like saying, yeah, yeah, that was a long time ago. Everybody that was there, every, all, all of you guys, you completely missed it. And they did unto him whatever they desired. And what was it? Now you get the name for John the Baptist. So now that we can see this, we're seeing now this connection with Salome. So let's go see if there's something more in Matthew 28. In In Luke, we saw the the body of Christ, like his bride is gone. In Mark, we see the end when he's talking about beheadings. That's why Salome is there. And you see the beheadings. She was the typology of the beheadings. And it had to do with John the Baptist because he has to first come, whether it's him or the typology of him with the workers, and restore the families back together because Christ is the one that brought the division. So the timing is directly related in every single case. Well, it's no different when you get to Matthew 28, like we said. There's a great earthquake, which is exactly what happens at the end of the sixth trumpet. And then what happens? He's like lightning from one end unto the other. If you go to Matthew chapter 24, you'll see in Matthew chapter 24, I think verse 27, Here it is. Matthew 24, verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The word coming for the Son of Man is literally about when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. This word for coming is only found in the Gospel of Matthew. Out of all of the Gospels, it's only found in the Gospel of Matthew And it's only found four times in all Gospels, only in Matthew. 
And all four of them are found in Matthew 24. Because why? It's literally about his coming and the end of the world. So what is his coming and the end of the world? Ta-da, Matthew 28. His returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, creating what? An earthquake that will rip the Mount of Olives in two. His countenance is as lightning from one end unto the other. And what does he say to them? Go out and teach everything that I've told, that I've commanded you, and I'm with you. What? Till the end of the world. <laughs> I love it. Like I told you, man, I could do this for 10 hours straight. I'm barely getting started. It's so exciting. Well, let me leave. Let me end this with one. Those of you that have been for around for a while know I just touched on it lightly. But let me show you what it is. And it goes back again. It's all a pre-mid post events things going on. So remember in Luke chapter 11, we've been talking about Jesus being as Jonah was, right? It says, for as Jonah was assigned, so Luke 11, starting in verse 30, for as Jonah was assigned unto the Ninevites, so, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. When you see this generation in the New Testament, it's talking about the end of days. He's talking to the final generation. In fact, let me take you to Luke 17 and show you exactly the context. The coming of the kingdom. Starting in verse 20, when the command is very, da, 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 the son of uh, the kingdom of God is coming, you know, and they talk about when's it going to be like <clears throat> everything here in this portion of Luke 17 is about them asking him prophetically, what are we going to know? When is it going to happen? What's going to happen? And in verse 24, he tells them, for as the lightning that light, it sound familiar out of one part under, hev uh, under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. This is Matthew 28. This is the end, returning, feet down. This is Matthew 24 of when he says he's coming. Okay, it's the end of the sixth year of trumpets. It's the end of the 13 years of tribulation. And then he says in verse 25, but first. This but first is the but before all these in Luke 21, verse 12. It's awesome. And what does he tell them? But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. You see, was he talking about the generation that he was in? No, none of this has to do with the generation he was in. The entire story is prophetic. He's telling them future. Okay. So when we go back to Luke 11, and this is why I saved it for the end, because there's some very heavy stuff in it. But on top of it all, it has never happened. Jesus was not yet the sign of Jonah in Luke chapter 11. Jesus said that he would be as Jonah was. When Jesus, in his resurrection, did he go around warning them in Jerusalem for 40 days, saying that, they're going to be compassed about, surrounded, and destroyed. If they didn't repent, repent or you're going to be destroyed after 40 days. No. The world will try to tell you that the 40 days meant 40 years. But it couldn't have been from his resurrection. Because his resurrection was in 33, the destruction was in 40, uh, uh, in 70. But you want to know a mystery? It's because the count didn't actually go from his resurrection. It went from when his ministry began. And his ministry began in 29 to 30 AD. 30 AD plus 40 years would bring you to, to uh, 70 AD. So the true typology, why? Because of the length of the generation, remember? A generation is 70 to 80, then soon cut off. So what does that put you? <clears throat> the revelation of that in the end is at the end of his ministry, the time is over. There's more details to that. I'm, I'm saving that for later. I'm building on that in a, for a future video. But what's happening here is that he's telling them he's going to do something for 40 days. 
This has never been fulfilled yet. This is 100% prophecy. And it has not yet been fulfilled. Because he did not do as Jonah did. This is the prophecy. This is the, the pointing to Luke 21. When he's telling them, when you see that you're compassed about and so forth, flee and get out, go to the mountains. This is that prophecy. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. Well, when you go to Mark, I believe it's chapter 8. In, yeah, in Mark chapter 8, listen to what it says, starting in verse uh, 12. Uh, no, starting in verse 11. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with them, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall be no sign given to this generation. And he left them and departed into a ship, again, uh, into the ship and again departed. That's the end of the story of the story of Jonah. Remember? No sign would be given to them. What happened? It's taking us right back to Mark chapter 9. Beginning of Mark chapter 9. They will have seen, but they, they don't know when they're going. It's the only one that doesn't get a sign. This group has no idea until, bang, something happens. And even when something happens, they don't know when they're going. No sign is given to the great multitude group. When it comes, bang, that's it. You see that? This is why this is a major contradiction. You'll hear Arabs, I mean, Muslims talk about it. You'll hear Christians, non-Christians talk about it. Many people, when they've seen all of these differences and this quote-unquote discrepancies within the scriptures, it has caused them, many of them, millions over the thousand, 2,000 years that have walked away. You could say, oh, their faith wasn't strong, it wasn't grounded. Fair enough. But you wouldn't know it. And what I mean by that is you wouldn't know if it was your best friend who was Christian and, and did church events and, and helped the needy and the poor and loved the Lord and was baptized. And, you know, a few years down the road, he reads about all these discrepancies and he's like, whoa. He talks to his pastor. He does Bible studies about it. Nobody can answer it, and the pastors will only say, oh, it's just points of view perspective. You can't explain that with this. And in many of the others, you can't explain that unless you have the revelation of the Gospels. So to get an answer like, well, it's just perspective, a lot of people say, well, that makes no sense. Over here, he said 40, and here he said nothing. This is a discrepancy within the writers. This is not Holy Spirit filled, they'll say. And your friend may come to see that and say, man, I'm just not so sure about this anymore. Was he not a believer? Was he not a Christian? This is why this revelation is so unbelievably powerful. But what this particular revelation of Jonah reveals is also extremely scary. Or I shouldn't say scary, but troubling. But only troubling when you first hear it, although I got to admit it's still troubling, but when you understand it, it's less troubling because you understand why it's going to be done. But it's troubling because of the thought that it has to be done. Okay, so what do we get in Luke? He's going to be as Jonah was for 40 days. Well, it just so happens that after the escape, he returns from the wedding. He's here for 40 days. He, he gives understanding. He has that banquet meal with the disciple workers. He's doing signs and wonders, warning around Jerusalem and maybe throughout the world. The disciple guys are following him. He leaves. They have understanding. They go to Jerusalem to a place chosen, and they receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and they go out from Jerusalem. Bang, Jerusalem is destroyed. The Lord will fulfill his Jonah 40 days that have not yet been fulfilled. In Mark, at the end of seals, again, they won't know this will be fulfilled, right? At the end, in that seventh year of seals. What about Matthew? Well, this is where Matthew, it starts to get a little intense. Because the intensity with Matthews 
is the fact that in Matthew's, it's connected to what we just read of the Lord coming at the end of the sixth trumpet when he says he raises again from the dead? Doesn't make sense, does it? Well, I'm not going to go too heavy into that, except to bring this to a close with this. In Matthew chapter 12, we've got the sign of Jonah. Starting in, let's go to verse 39. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Verse 40, you'll see it's not the same sign as Luke's. So again, a very apparent contradiction unless you have the revelation. And it says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights. What will the world tell you about the three days and three nights? Jews will tell you that any portion of a day is considered a day. No, that's absolutely untrue in this wording three days and three nights. Not a portion of one day and a portion of another. If it just said three days, I mean, maybe you can dispute that. But you cannot dispute three days and three nights. But because the world reads from the Gospel of Matthew and believe that this is already fulfilled and not prophecy, They'll say that Jesus was three days and three nights in the grave. Well, that's impossible. It's literally impossible to have already happened. Because the entire story from being taken into the hands of sinful men, crucified and resurrected, we've got 14 or 15 verses in Scripture that tell us he was resurrected on the third day. How can he be resurrected on the third day from being taken into the hands of sinful men, in beaten and spit on and accused and brought before the magistrates and then be crucified. And then try to tell me it's still three days and three nights? That would be impossible. <clears throat> that would be closer to the fifth day, almost four days complete. It's impossible. This says three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This is prophecy. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth means what? At some point on the fourth day. It's a full three days and a full three nights, 72 hours in the grave. Well, what's after 72 hours? Sometime on the fourth day, you see? You start, to, you start to say, uh, wait a second, right? Wait a second, what's going on here? Well, let me show you another connecting example to what's taking place. If you go into Mark, Luke's gospel and Mark's gospel, and you see the story of, the, um, uh, uh, of, uh, of Judas, you find out that only Matthew's gospel tells you how much money. So in Luke's gospel, there's no money mentioned. It just says money. Uh, in Mark, it says about money, like given to him, whatever it was. But in Matthew, it tells you it's 30 pieces of silver. It's pretty interesting because it's Matthew's gospel, which Matthew means what? Matthew means trumpets, right? Matthew's trumpets. So sometime in the midst of trumpets, Messiah is going to get cut off because he's going to be what? The typology of being sold for 30 pieces of silver. Okay? He's going to be, he's going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And remember Zechariah? Zechariah has the chapters to years. So if you go into three years and change into, which means sometime in the 11th year, and you go to Zechariah chapter 11, in Zechariah chapter 11, you see that this is the typology of Satan being cast down. The cedar of old, the, uh, the vintage has come down from the forest of the vintage. This is when Satan's being cast down at the fifth trumpet. And look at what it says in Zechariah 11 verse 8. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month. Uh, verse 9. 
Then said I, I will not feed you. That that dieth, let die. That that be cut off will be cut off. Let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I made with all people. He made it at the end of seals, at the seventh seal. So now he has to break his covenant because Satan's being cast down. The generation is coming to an end. And it was broken in that day. And look at what we read about in Zechariah verse 12. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said, Cast unto me, and the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was praised at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and, uh, and cast them to the potter of the house of the Lord. Then I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Israel <coughs> and Judah. Guys, this is mid trumpets. This is mid trumpets when Messiah is cut off. This all relates back to Daniel chapter 9. This is all about <clears throat> the reason why the 30 pieces of silver are mentioned only in Matthew and are directly connected to the portion of trumpets in Zechariah. You see, when we go back into Daniel 9 verse 25 and it says seven weeks, which is years, and then comma and the three score and two, which is a little over three years. That means some point in the 11th year. <clears throat> what happens at that point? That after that, some point in the 11th year, right? 11 years and change, right? Or 10 years and change, which means in the 11th year, shall Messiah be cut off. That is the prophetic implication to Messiah being cut off after the city and the streets were rebuilt and the temple being rebuilt. It all began at the beginning of trumpets in Zechariah 8. It's all directly connected. So what do we see? Messiah is going to be cut off. And we know that this period of time will last until what? Right around the time of the end of the sixth trumpet. How do we know this? Because in Matthew's... Um, uh, where was it? Because in Matthew's story of the prophetic days, sorry, sign of Noah, we know that the Son of Man did not fulfill a full three days and three nights and resurrect on the fourth day. He did not fulfill this yet. There's only one place in Scripture where there is a event that goes three days and three nights and something happens at the sunrise of the following day and that answer is found in where is it <laughs> i just had a brain fart where did it go <clears throat> uh oh wait Zechariah 11, uh, sorry, sorry, Revelation 11. We see the two witnesses witness for their 1260. When that witness is over, war is made out against them. That's right around that 11th year, right after 10 in the 11th year. And what happens? They're killed. It says in their dead bodies, three days and a half. What is three days and a half? You see, what is after three days and a half? You can't get around and say that that's not three days and three nights and then a half. This is the only event in, on biblical prophetic history uh, in, in prophecy that has something that takes place after three days and three nights at some point in the fourth day, which would probably be at sunrise time. What is this period of time it's right at the end of the sixth year 
of trumpets. What happens after these three days and three nights and a half, meaning at, at sunrise of the fourth day? An hour later, there's what? A great earthquake. And he's going to be seen as what? Lightning from one end unto the other. The seventh trumpet sounds. The mystery is over and everything that is in heaven and on earth is now his. What happens? When we go to the resurrection story, there's what? A great earthquake. This, and the Lord, like lightning from one end unto he of heaven to the other. And all power in heaven on earth is given unto him. So, Alan, are you telling me that it says Messiah is going to die again? No, I'm not. I'm reading it from Scripture. I'm just the one. I'm just the mouthpiece. It says that he's going to die again. But without going too much further, because, again, this is all about the Gospels and to show where these connections are. And you see, we bring it right to the end by the time we get to the end. What happens here at the end? The Lord is now here. He has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. There's that one year like Zechariah 14. There's that last verse of Daniel chapter 9, 27, where he's going to bring all for all the stuff that they did. He's going to bring destruction upon them for all the abominations that they did. But why is Messiah going to do this again? The answer, as I bring this to an end, because it's heavy and deep, the answer is found in Hebrews chapter 6. Let's start in verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, hello, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves to themselves the Son of Man afresh, re-crucify, and put him to an open chain. Do you know why this must happen? Because there's going to be a falling away during the time of trumpets as a Judas type, there is going to be a falling away of some group or portion, however it plays out, <clears throat> during the time of trumpets that are of the priestly line of the 144,000, somewhere in there. We know this because in Numbers chapter 20, they struck the rock twice. Once was for Moses, which represented the house of Israel, and once was for his brother Aaron, the priestly line as the high priest, and they struck the rock twice. The high priest as the 144,000. Remember, when Messiah comes, as I finish off now, truly as I bring it to an end with this, you see when I said at the end of Mark 16, Right? He, he was, um, uh, what did he do? He was received up, and it says, and he sat on the right hand of God. And these guys will go out working, and the Lord confirming these things, and him fall, them following wherever he goes. This is the 144,000 reference, just like you see in, in Revelation 14. But what do you see when he sits on the right hand of God? The connection to this is at the end of seals, when he comes at the end of six years of seals, at that seventh year of seals. He's now received up. This is the great multitude rapture being received up in the seventh year of seals at the end of Mark. And a group being chosen that was chosen is now going to go out. And the Lord confirming with them as they're doing these signs following. But when does he sit on the right hand of God? Well, for this, we bring it to Psalms 110. Is it 110? We bring it to Psalms 110, starting in verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. See, at the end of seals, out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Let's skip to verse 4. 
the Lord hath sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. What is he doing? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's what? The high priest. He is the priest and king after the order of Melchizedek. Aaron was the high priest. In Hebrews, we're told that the Melchizedek in Christ, it is the highest of all high priests, of course, because it is the Son of Man. It is the Lord there. He is what? Over the priestly line who are the 144,000. And yet it is the priestly line who caused the second strike. And what do we see the time frame of the 30 pieces of silver? In Matthew, at the time when the Lord comes to the end of his three years and change, in the 11th year, 10 years and change, in the 11th year, and the cutoff comes. You see, the three days and three nights have not been fulfilled. We are told the exact understanding of what Christ did fulfill the first time. You see, who are those who will have been tasted of heavenly gifts, filled with the Holy Ghost, all of those things? You see, go read Revelation 14. In Revelation 14, you see that it's the 144,000 standing before the throne, having the Father's name written on them. They can't be left. They have to be saved, whoever it is that falls, because they have the Father's name written on them. So Christ is going to die again for them because they cannot be left. You see, here's what happened the first time at Christ's death and resurrection. You have the angel telling them what happened. Luke 24, 6, he is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet with you in Galilee, saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, comma, and that means Separate that, now add this. Be crucified. Separate that and add this. The third day, rise again. You see, not rise again from the dead. The third day, rise again. Matthew says, rise again from the dead. Brothers and sisters, Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross for all of us was finished on the cross at his death taken into the hands of sinful men, crucified, and resurrected the third day. You see, the total story was approximately two and a half days from the moment he was touched and taken into the hands of sinful men. He could not, absolutely 100%, did not yet fulfill the prophecies that he said he would be as Jonah. Do you understand why now it begins with the 40 days of the Son of Man? Do you understand why now there is no sign when he comes that they're going to be wondering they will have seen him come and then they don't know when they're going? That would be excruciating. And then why at the end there is a sign? It'll be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Because why? Because now he's got to go and get them. Because why? It'll be the time of the millennial reign. Remember, what has he got to do? Right? He's got to restore in that final year, but what's going to happen? Remember what we said at the end of Matthew? I said I was going to bring it to an end. I'm really bringing it to an end now. Remember what happens at the seventh trumpet. You go to Revelation 10, it says, As soon as the seventh trumpet begins to blast, the mystery shall be finished. Why? Because the Lord will have resurrected, gone up, and then returned, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Everything in heaven and on earth is now his. And what did we read from Matthew's portion only in chapter 16 when he comes at the end of the sixth trumpet to start the seventh? What did he say he was going to do? That his reward was with him. What is he going to do? He's going in, right? He's going into the belly of the earth. And what's he going to do? He's bringing all those, the Abrahams, the the, all of them, the, the, the Daniels. Daniel will stay in his plot until the last day. This is the Lord coming feet down on the Mount of Olives in his la at the last day. You see, 
This is when he comes. This is why he's going into the belly of the earth. Remember, the Jews don't believe in heaven. The Jews don't think they go to heaven. Why? Because they don't. Unless they become messianic, right? And they come to Christ. But other than that, they don't. Theirs is the promise of the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. How fantastic is that? See that? This is the revelation of the prophetic mysteries within the Gospels. It is over the top, incredible. It is mind blowing. I, I don't even have the, the proper words to use. It is just that exciting. Because once you understand it, once you see it, you can never, ever unsee it. I promise you. You would have to simply deny it and just refuse to look at it ever again. But it'll still be in the back of your mind that you knew it. See that? Did you see me skip a beat? Did I miss any connection to where it should have been and show where it was? No. This is just over three hours. I say I could do it for 10 hours. I could do, it, I could do this for a whole weekend just in the revelations of the Gospels. God is good, brothers and sisters. And his spirit is leading in his son, the word. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. I pray this blesses you. Seek it out. Search it. Pray over it. Pray over it. Ask the spirit to give you the eyes and the understanding to follow it and see it. And spend your time in him, diligently seeking this out, and you will be richly rewarded with the revelation of understanding it. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.